Hey everyone and welcome to Television from the Multiverse, the DC Comics TV podcast from Mailflies TV. I am Peter and joining me as always is Connor. Yes, contrary to what you may believe, judging by some of my tweets, I did survive. <laughs> I actually did, because you sent some messages to the group chat we have, I did actually manage to decipher one of them after a good couple of minutes of really looking at <laughs> did it. Did you actually? Um, I looked at them like the next morning when someone sent a message, I was like, Jesus, that was bad. I was I was proper drunk. Somehow I, I, I construed what you were trying to say is that there was a Mortal Kombat-esque finish him on Flash, but it took a little bit of deciphering to get to that point. But uh, more yeah. on that more on that later. Small confession. Mm-hmm. I, I put a poll on the Twitters and uh, the people said, well, you're up, you're there, you might as well do Drunk Supergirl. Not sure I remember any of Supergirl outside of like two moments. So we'll see see how much because it was last because I was like, well, I'd already done the other two, and uh, we'll see how much uh, this jogs my memory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe a lesson there that you can't do three drunk episodes in a row because you won't remember the mm. third one. It's it's possible. Yes. Um. So we're going to about Flash and Supergirl and Arrow and Batwoman as as we typically do. I had all four on this week, and because uh, next week I believe we only have Flash and Arrow, which makes sense because we had a week just there without uh, those two shows, so clearly we're yeah. just swapping them around uh, for whatever reason. But that is what's going to happen on the show. We have a little bit of news first, uh, which we'll talk about, uh, all pertaining to Stargirl, uh, one of which is uh, not necessarily a big deal um, and not necessarily unexpected given that Jeff Johns was show running the show. I'll mention this one first, this one's least interesting. Um, yeah. So, Queen Sugar co-showrunner Melissa Carter has been named as the new co-showrunner of Stargirl. Um, she was already as, on the show as an executive producer and presumably in the writing room, uh, but now she's going to be along with Jeff Johns. Um, I guess this just kind of makes sense in the sense that Johns has never ran a show before, so it's, if anything, I'm surprised that it took this long to give him a, a co-runner. It could be that, it could be as well he's struggling with schedules, because we've seen that his comics work, at least, has been slipping. I wonder if there has been some impact on the... Well, the the show's been delayed as well, because the show was meant to debut around now, if not maybe a month earlier, and it's now coming in spring 2020, so... Yeah, we learned that back in, like, Comic-Con, I think it was, they announced that. So we've known this for a while, this delay. But, I mean, again, there's delays to this, there's delays to his comics work. Clearly... Um, something is alright, and it may not be, all be him and Italy. There may be other troubles with the show or whatever that's that's, that's doing yeah, this. Yeah. But um, not surprised. I mean, obviously, like I don't know how far into the season they are in terms of of, of production or, or making it. I have to imagine they're fairly into I, it. At this I know point. there's a a leaked list of all the episode titles has come out. Some of which are pretty interesting. That would suggest to me that they've already written the show. That that yeah, me too. Because. Uh, Generally speaking, you you have you know the the episode titles get leaked by the script front page. Yes, um, but what I mean is I, I, that to me, it's like given they're all there, that they've written the entire show. So the, yes. you know, the, the, I have to imagine they're shooting right now, uh, at the very the, least. Yeah, um, I, I I would have thought that they'd have started shooting by now already. So uh, given, uh, you know, given that we don't know the exact time that's coming, you know, spring. But I think before we were just kind of told early next year so i don't know if there's been more delays so the other part here though that's far more weird and interesting uh especially given so i just want to remind you that you know recently they've been saying now dc universe is still alive and well don't worry about hbo max taking all of its thunder um still gonna have exclusive shows just the dc universe and originals and yada 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 and that came off the back of course of uh, doom patrol being a, a dual show where it's going to be on hbo max at the same time uh, which we kind of chuckled and said, well, it's because it's the good one. They want to have the good show on, <laughs> on the big service. Um, here's, here's, here's a weird bit of news that kind of, again, makes it look like DC Universe is not a priori uh, to the company as a whole. Because this news is that CW is going to air Stargirl episodes a day. One day after the premiere on, on uh, DC Universe, which makes me think that it won't be a Friday this time. Mm, no, probably not. Because I don't see them airing it on a Saturday on CW. They'd uh, have to be airing it during their rerun slots, which would be weird. I mean, kind of technically it is a rerun, but CW won't treat it like that. Yeah, not to most of the audience. Uh, the vast majority no. of the audience on CW, this is going to be a new episode of a show. It is. This is this is really interesting and kind of baffling. Like HBO Max, we kind of understood they wanted okay, new service flagship. Let's show some attention to the DC side of things to get those people on board. I got it. 
saying they want to put one of their shows on the CW, I can kind of see as well, like, okay, you know, after it finishes airing, maybe you start, you know, airing it on the CW. You know, kind of like how they do with like Netflix deals, like the you know the you know the seasonal finish on the CW, and then you know within like it, two weeks it's it, on Netflix. Yeah, here's the weird thing though, is that so Doom Patrol is going to be also on HBO Max, this other big service. Star yes. Girl, which is arguably the other most anticipated thing, because let's face it, Swamp Thing. Well, some people did like it, had a really mixed reception, and was cancelled before it even aired its second episode. Um, it's got its animated stuff, of course. Uh, but ultimately, all it's really left with is Titans in terms of exclusive, big, original... Yeah, like so coming up, that'll be exclusive. That We know there's the, the Harley Quinn animated show, which starts in, like, a week or something? Yeah, it's and Titans soon. Season 3. What, what, Titans Season 3, and no, they have confirmed another season of Young Justice as well, to be fair. Okay, alright, so they've got a couple of animated shows, and they've got Titans, but there are two other big live-action shows, right? One of which we already know is good and is well-loved. And then the other one, which we're hoping will be good, and it's got Jeff Johns behind it, so there's a lot of reason to maybe put I'm, some stock into it. I'm not going to lie. The fact that they went, this will fit at home right on the CW, <laughs> has, has concerned me a little bit. But at the same time, it's about a teenage girl, so it kind of makes sense that it, does, no, it would does. fit there. It does. Even it if does. it's really good. You know, I mean, I always... This is the thing. Like, I think with anything, it, like... I mean, put, put it this way, right? Buffy the Vampire Slayer. They had a television show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, even though it wasn't the CW at the time, it was the WB, but the WB became the CW mixed with UPN, right? So yeah. spiritually it was the CW of its time. That show is an all-timer and it came on this network. So there's no reason why eventually CW will have that one show, just kind of like how USA Network has Mr. Robot or like how uh, AMC has its Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. You know, that one show that stands out amongst the pack and says, we can do quality, right? There's no reason it's why so Stargirl... Not- I got yeah. really notably snobby there on that. <laughs> you know, USA, yeah, sure. Is there, no, no one's arguing with that. But there, there is at least like four people listening to this going, what about Walking Dead? Walk, Walking Dead, after the great pilot nosedived, and I'm no, not going to... I, that's why I didn't argue with you, but I can just hear them. <laughs> I can hear the listeners shouting at you. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I know some people will be saying Mad Men, and I get that people love that show. It wasn't for me. I get that that's also pretty critically acclaimed. Fair enough. But, hey, that was a while ago now, right? Better Call Saul's still going, so... Yeah, do you know what was even longer ago? Buffy. <laughs> true, true. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I'm... Hey, which is kind of... Well, yeah, but that, the difference here is that the argument is our opposite, because the argument with Mad Men is that it's to prove that AMC have other things. My point with Buffy is that that's the one thing that they've had. Well, that <laughs> and Angel, technically. But Angel's, you know, kind of like Better Call Saul, an extension of... Yeah. The, the one thing. So, like... Well, my point being is that there's no reason to say because this comes from a slightly different source that maybe this will have a, gl- a a sheen to it that's better than CW in general and maybe it'll have it will have that higher caliber and I think you know Jeff Johns even got some good episodes at a Smallville and that was particularly impressive have at the time. Seen those episodes? I've seen them. I like the JSA episode, which and I hated everything in Smallville at that point, so it was notable that I actually liked that two part. So mm. you know. Given that Jeff Johns is behind the whole thing, it could lead to some good stuff, and um, it does give a, us a bit of an interesting pickle, and we, we said at the start of the season that this show is for CW shows, and now Stargirl's kind of, like, one of them. Yeah, to be fair, we actually did say, you know, if there is a show that comes along and it fits on this, then maybe we'll just include True. it in this, whereas Doom Patrol, we know... It's better than this show, let's be honest. Let's just call it what it is. And it deserves its own spotlight. <laughs> true, true. Uh, so Stargirl, we'll definitely get an episode one review on it, so it may end up on this podcast as opposed to getting separate reviews if it feels like it fits here instead. Uh, yeah, we'll judge it at the time. We'll, we'll judge it after we watch the episode. But uh, very interesting. But uh, to go back to the, sort of the original thing I was teasing at, like DC Universe, I think more than ever after this announcement, feels kind of like a weird entity that almost feels pointless it's so weird because it was just i think was it last week that the titans renewal happened and we were yeah. like well this is a show of confidence in in dc universe for at least another year and we and were then, like, maybe, maybe it's not dead and then then this happens and yeah don't get me wrong I, I, obviously young justice is great and people are probably looking forward to harley quinn and some people do like titans i'm not saying there's literally nothing but they're diminishing the value of this service so much. Unless you care about the comic books, right? If you care about the comic books, then obviously there's a reason it's to have it. It's a fantastic service, yeah. yeah. There's a reason to have it otherwise. But that's not what they're primarily selling it as. They're primarily selling it as original content, this TV show content that they're making. Surely and- this has to be bundled in with HBO Max. 
I think at this point it has to be an add-on. At this point it has to be yeah. like, oh, pay a few extra dollars and you get DC's library too. Yeah, it has to be. Because they're, they're already putting all the DC movies on the HBO Max. They're already putting on... I have to imagine they're putting on some of the old TV shows because they do own them. Like, why wouldn't they? They're part of Warner's library. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, so the value to pay for this as an entirely separate service over HBO Max is baffling if you if you're not interested in the comics like if, if you if you're if you want the comics it's a great service at a great price yeah, i mean I'll, I'll i'll say it again you don't even have to lower the price make this a comics only thing maybe make the delay better like maybe you know go to marvel's thing where it's only six months behind you know and to say okay so this is what the service is six months later every comic's there right and just sell it as that all the tv and movie content just put it on HBO Max because it feels like we're going that way, and it's not, it almost feels like they're just delaying it inevitable. But then this one murkies it up even more because it's like, oh, but some shows will just be CW shows. Now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so strange. This is this is so weird that this even because at least with HBO Max it's still another premium service you have to pay for. Then putting it on a free channel the next day devalues that service. So and, if, and it, it is going on CW's catch up site as well. <laughs> so it's even on demand for free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look. It. Yeah, it's baffling, and I just. Which basically I means. Just don't know what to say. Which basically means if you're a young Justice fan, and there's a good reason why you would be, you can buy the service when that season's done for one month, watch the whole season, and then happily quit for another eleven months or more, perhaps depending on how long it takes them to make the next season, <laughs> and yeah. then just come back for the next season for one month. Because they have very, unless you, again, unless you care about the actual comic books, which maybe you do, but this is the weird thing though, is that if you do care a lot about DC's characters and you do care about the comics, there's a good chance that you actually buy monthly comic books, or at least the trades, right? Um, there is kind of a weird kind of middle ground here where you want to care about them, but not so much that you're actually spending a lot of money on books every month so that you're happy with a service that's behind like this. No, to be fair, like I you know, I have not watched anything on, on DC Universe since since Young Justice ended. Or was or something after that. I don't even remember anymore. Since since we uh, stopped covering the stuff basically. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, basically. Because, you know, I, I haven't watched uh, I didn't watch Titans uh, yet, obviously. I mean, um, we do that for Patreon at some point. But we've we've thought about yeah, doing yeah. some and of the old I'll shows. For probably Patreon. check out Harley Quinn. Don't be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but I have been quite happy to keep up my subscription because I read a lot of the comics on there. And you know, I'm someone who you know buys a lot of monthly comics and trades. But it's so convenient, and it's just all there, uh, and it's great for older material, especially. Um, I, I mean, so for I, me, it's, it's worth it. I I would happily. Like, I've said this before, I'll say it again, if they, if, they, if they doubled the price but made comics day and date with new releases, I'd get it and never look back. I'd never buy another comic again. I, they'd just have me for life. Because I'd just read mm. the new books as they came out on a service like that. I'll pay $20 a month for it. I don't care. Like, I think yeah. that's fair. Getting everything brand new day and date. When you know, I spend way more than that in comic books every month. Way more than oh, that. I, I could spend that in a week without, without even thinking. I think I do most weeks. There's very few weeks where I'm spending less than that on comics, from DC yeah. specifically. So... If they give me $25, $25 even a month and you get everything day and date, new releases, happily, I would never I would never get rid of it. I'd have it for life. All right, so there's a good cut-out chunk there where we went on a tangent about video game streaming and, and whatnot. But um, we're going to talk about Supergirl, get the reviews, um, with uh, episode 7 of season 5. This is called Tremors. Uh, <laughs> there is no Kevin Bacon, although I was uh, waiting for him at any point. So, although the, the mom from Stranger Things did show up, though, as uh, one of Leviathans, so, I mean, that was a thing. Mm. Uh, but, so, this episode, I mean, okay, it's better than last week's because the bar was set so unbelievably low that it, like, if it wasn't the, better, I'd be worried. The problem is, you could describe any other episode of the show <laughs> as, well, it was better than last week's. <laughs> This is true. I mean, there was some elements to this that I kind of enjoyed just for being a goofy superhero show. Um, as silly as the Earthbender villain is, um, you know, when, he, when, he's, when he's like forming up from the earth and he's firing like, you know, rock balls at people and Supergirl's like punching them and blasting them with heat, heat and it vision. looked about as good as Supergirl always does. Yeah, yeah. I I thought when he appeared out of the ground, it looked okay. It, it looked worse when he actually sent the shockwave. The shockwave looked worse than I thought he did it when did, he came yeah. up. Yeah, um, not terrible though. Like, yeah, yeah. Not uh, by this show's standards, perfectly fine. 
Yeah, but Supergirl swooped in and saved Lena because that's who he's after. Because Lady Leviathan, which is what I'm calling the old woman until we have a better name. Uh, Why not? She shows up with a gun and is like, and she she Batman's at the scene as well when she realizes she can't kill Lena because Lena's got like a, a shield or something on. I remember this. Yeah, uh, she Batman's out the scene and she's like, right, we need something to, to disperse our plan to control everyone, um, or whatever they're doing with the the VR and the the, the Mal's powers, you know, whatever the, the plan is. Uh, to make everyone better through kind of mind control, <laughs> kind of. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's always gone well, hasn't it? Whenever, yeah. that, whenever anyone's had that idea. Totally not an evil plan. Uh, yeah, it but never comes across like a dictator. Uh, but she's like, hey, right. So Lex always theorized that Superman had a place where he stored all the stuff that that uh, Lex used to try and kill him. I just have to find it, right? So she wants to get to the fortress. She doesn't know what it's called, but she wants to get to the fortress. And Kara's just like, oh, sure, yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, well, this is this is. I mean, the smart thing on Lena's part here is that she doesn't like bring it up. She lets Supergirl bring it up and kind of yeah, like she, do, she doesn't ask. Oh, do you know where this is? Kara's yeah, just like oh, yeah, that'll be in the fortress. That's, that's fine. Well, let, let's go. Now she brings up that Lex maybe had stuff that he could you know work against him, but the, I, mean, I assume it's all destroyed. Like Superman destroyed it all. He's like, no, yeah. that's not true. Like the, the, he's probably got a lot of it stored in the and, fortress still. And she's like, well, you might as well come with me because I don't know what I'm looking for. Yeah, bring a Parker. Um, and they go and she's like all impressed with the computer uh, there is a weird thing where superman's got the fortress rigged to like trap and like like i mean we don't get to see what kalex was going to do to the like to lena if, if the countdown like finished but it very much implied it was like an ed 209 thing where it was like you know you have five seconds to confirm your identity or <laughs> i'm going to blow you to hell it kind of felt like that, yeah. Yeah, which is very on Superman. So clearly, I don't think that's what was going to happen. But that's what it felt like when she was trapped in this ice prison, and the computer was like, yeah, "Identify yourself, Luther detected, Luther detected." Kara has to kind of jump in and be like, hey, "No, it's fine. Just uh, yeah. chill out." Uh, but she wants a uh, myriad, which was a season one thing. Uh, so I mean, credit for remembering some season one stuff, I suppose. Well, I mean. Last episode, we were complaining they couldn't remember season one stuff, so, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, they couldn't remember and made up something that should have been introduced a long time ago as well. Uh, but, so, Lena sort of wants to steal this thing to, like, disperse our, our plan, and uh, there's a bit of heart-to-hearts where she's joking about, oh, I was trying to save you on the plane when we went to that prison, but all, little did I know you could fly and you were saving me the whole time. Ha 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 ha. Oh, it's terrible dialogue. Yes, so Leviathan Lady goes back to Leviathan. We meet uh, Stranger Things mom, and uh, I think Chromacom was uh, the Earthbender's name. And he's like, Oh, you failed, you stupid old woman. I'm going to go and deal with this. And that's when he goes to try and kill Lena. Fails because Supergirl intervenes. And he's like, Okay, I lost them. Uh, I can't detect them, though, because he can sense everything through Earth. He's like, Well, if, if, if I can't connect, connect to them through the Earth, it means they're the, they're the one place on the planet that's not Earth, that's not of Earth. Uh, so he deduces that they're at the fortress. Do you know what really bothered me about this? More, mm-hmm. more than anything is, she could just be flying. <laughs> <laughs> she, she could be, that's true. <laughs> she, she just wouldn't be on the earth. She could, very much could be. Um, I also, all of a sudden, Leviathan's this, like, I mean, I guess, I mean, secret organization is more like what it is in the comics, I suppose, to an extent. Although, not really, because, like, there's a leader who's a Leviathan, and it's a whole thing. It's like nothing mm. like the comics, but... Um, because like, this secret organization and like this guy's like an alien from like a sister planet of Krypton who's been here for like thousands of years. Uh, no, he was not not Daxum, we assume. Not, no, because no, it really says what planet it is. I just don't remember what planet it said. Oh, okay, well, uh, it was way too drunk by this point. But it wasn't Daxum. Uh, but he says uh, that um, he's been here for thousands of years. He was here at Pompeii. He was here at you know this flood. I even mentioned Noah's flood, the time of Noah's flood, which I thought was a weird thing for him to say that, as if that was just a factual thing that happened. But I suppose what he really means is that he's in the the drawings of Noah's flood. So presumably, no, I got around. the point. What I felt like is. He is implying, no, that was a real thing, and it was so long ago that we don't even believe it was a real thing anymore. Sure. Um, but I guess the implication is that he caused it, that it wasn't like a biblical thing, is that Earthbender Man actually, by yeah, manipulating sure. the Earth, caused the yeah. flood, which makes some sense. Um, but uh, yeah, so Earth Man eventually shows up at the fortress, and there's a bit of a fight. Supergirl and Lena team up with their, their fancy gun and uh, free, freeze I did breath. See that you could, uh... You could see they forgot to edit out some of the cables for the for the for the stunts in this scene. <laughs> I didn't notice actually. Yeah, I well, I didn't in the in the time, but I saw it on uh, on Twitter the next day. Ah, very good. 
Very good. Uh, so they beat him, but then Supergirl notices Lena's carrying Myriad and says, what's happening? And she's like, well, I'm using you, like, you use me. And she confesses that she knew she was Supergirl before she told her because of Lex, and says that she hates her and that she betrayed her trust and she's going to use Myriad to do yada yada yada, and leaves, she's reprogrammed the computer to trap Supergirl in the prison that was set up earlier, the trap. And yeah. Supergirl's in there with Lena's kryptonite in the ice, and She's, she's she's actually still in there at the end of the episode. Lena uses a teleporter to to leave. It's convenient, and, that. I mean, I kind of buy she's got one. I mean, no, I do too. It's just convenient that she's got one. I, I want one. Of, of all of all the things I may have a problem with, her having a teleporter is not annoying. Honestly, I, I wasn't really making yeah. planning. It was more jealousy. Okay, <laughs> fair. Uh, Brainy and Alex get lured uh, to Rip Rose's body, which has a bomb in it, trying to kill them. Uh, they survive, of course, but uh, Alex gets a little bit shaken up and is in the med bay and, you know, Kelly comes to speak to her and is all worried that she may have died and she almost breaks up with her, but then at the end, Alex, like, gives her a big speech and they hug and kiss and so happy. That's basically... Okay, all. I don't remember any of this plot. That's all I've got to say about that. I really don't give a I shit about any of it. All of the other stuff, you know, the, the, uh, I couldn't have told you before, but that's all coming back to me as we're talking. I couldn't have told you there was this plot at all in the episode. Well, the, Even other, now, I'm... the other splinter of this plot is that Brainy's inhibitor is damaged for a bit, so he goes supernova with the, the intelligence, and he figures out where Leviathan is based on the Rip Roar armor. Um, kind of sh almost Sherlock Holmes style, where he's like, oh, th this thing can only be from there, and this can only lead to that, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Him and Alex go to Leviathan's uh, base, their secret base, and they, they go down, um, and Supergirl's going to come to help them, but gets distracted by Earth Bender Man, and uh, yeah, so they don't really find anything. I, actually, I don't actually remember how they get out of this, because they're, they're, they're back at the end of the episode. Um, there's there's one shot I remember of uh, Stranger Things mom looking at them through like a little like magical portal window thing. She's sort of spying on them when they're in the elevator. Um, okay. I guess they just don't find that. I think I don't remember having any confrontation. Okay. Obviously, I don't remember this plot, but yeah. that feels a bit weird. That Brainy's like this. This is exactly where it all is, and then there's well, nothing they, there. They find a secret elevator and a secret button, and they go down. Um. Unless they shipped out already, you know. Yeah, I guess they just left already, but I, I don't remember that moment. <laughs> this moment's completely escaping me. I don't remember how <laughs> how this was wrapped up. I guess it was just and, maybe and he didn't even have a drop of alcohol. Yeah, which maybe tells you just how uh, forgettable this stuff is. Or like, I, I don't. I, f I feel less bad about forgetting this plot now because you're struggling. And you're uh, really yeah, 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 nothing yeah. comes of it. Like Alex is with uh, with Kelly at the end. Um, so they, they obviously get out okay. There's not like that much of a confrontation if there is one, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so weird. Um, the other subplot is that Jean is having weird flashes of Mal in his head, so he goes into his uh his like meditation, whatever he calls it, and sees his father. And his father's like, oh, it's nice to see you, son. Oh, Mal's not in the Phantom Zone. He's a uh, in National City. He's uh somewhere in the vicinity. <laughs> he's, he's he's chilling with Lena. And yeah, well, that was the weird thing, is that there wasn't really, like, a, a moment where there was, like, done, 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 he's with Lena. Like, you know, Jean goes to see him and, like, appears in the in the cell with him. And I feel like next episode, like, he's going to be like, oh, by the way, Lena's was harboring my brother. This is maybe something we should look into. Why, why, why does she have him in a cage? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it has a lot less weight after she's already revealed herself yes to Kara. Like, yes it was like Kara's like yeah i know well, she's evil now i mean if that's how they, they they know to go check the fortress for Kara when she's not showing up like hey this is concerning yeah, it's like true. oh she went to she, she was with lena and they went to the fortress oh hey that shifted because i've just discovered that lena was harbor, harboring my brother so the end of this is basically just that the uh they hug because mal looks into his mind and sees the truth so that kind of i mean we don't actually hear him say forgives him or anything but it seems like they're they're on the mend. there's an implication yeah, yeah. Matt mal seems to be uh, letting bygones be bygones, and he's on team team Jean now. So, cool. Um, that's basically. It. I have no rants this week. I have nothing really interesting to say about the episode. It's just kind of by the numbers. <sighs> yeah, I mean, there was one moment where I like. I, I think Lena's plot's been bad, and it's been bad for a long time. Uh, even before this yeah. season, I've not really been into it. it. Hell, even season three, when she was doing all that stuff with Sam, like, on the side. I, th I think we've been saying this for a while, that we like 
Lena as a character, and I think the actress is pretty good and has like a lot of charm for pulling it off. There, yeah, there was a moment in this though where she kind of like screamed at Kara, and it felt a bit off to me. That's fair. Uh, she kind of like screamed. Uh, I can't remember what the line was, but it was. Uh, she sort of let herself really go for it. It was kind of really sort of like emotional stream of like saying, mm. "It wasn't you betrayed me, but it was something like that." Along those lines, yeah. yeah. Um, and it felt like she was letting that go. And I was like, you know, I feel like because I've never really bought into this friendship, not really. This feels yeah. really too much. It feels like I, just overdoing it. Um, and it's not that I think she's a bad actress, but I do think, I think they've misplayed her so much because from the second she showed up. We were sitting going, oh, when she's turning evil, because she always had this kind of like it felt like it was a fake thing. It felt yeah, like... it, it was always she was one one step away from cracking. Yeah, and because that she is kind of cracking now, but it's also trying to present that she's just she's wronged and she's not evil. Because she even says to Carol, she's walking out, you know, I'm not a villain, so you shouldn't have treated me like one. But I don't know, you always had that look in your eye, <laughs> and also just. The bigger problem that she didn't really ever treat her like a villain. Like the show treated her like, oh, she's going to be a villain. And mm -hmm. this is going to sound weird, but I think it waited too long. Because mm -hmm. by the time that now she's okay, now she's a villain, don't care anymore. If this had been like at the end of season three, where we got the moment where she kind of feels betrayed and turns, I feel like because we'd spent all the season going, when's it going to happen? When's it going to yeah. happen? We might have cared then. I now know. it's just like, eh, well, this was it's been so long coming. I know I'm going to be in hot, hot water for saying this because I know Lena has a lot of fans on Twitters, but Lena honestly has not really been that good plot wise for a long time, and arguably, arguably has negatively impacted the show for even being on it. Because you look back at what you know, she came out in season two. Season one is still the best season, for better or worse, it's still the best season. Yeah, and she wasn't there in that season, and. She's been here season two onwards, and honestly, I don't necessarily know how much of her plot I've really liked since she was on the show. There's always been potential for her to have good plot, and that's why she was, you know, it was like, okay, maybe she'll get good early on. But I've never felt the friendship, I've never bought it, and obviously that, that disaster of an episode last week obviously that does no favours, but like even with this episode, I'm like, I, they've not earned this at all, and I don't... No, I'm, I'm with you to a point in that I like Lena as a Generally speaking, over the past you know, a few seasons, I like Lena as a character. I think she has quite good interactions with most of the characters. Uh, dialogue, you know, she plays the scenes well. Mm -hmm. I think I can't, I can't think of a single interesting plot that she's ever had. And in terms of actively bad things, there was that whole relationship with Jimmy. Oh yeah, terrible. That that was atrocious. Um, but like I, said, I think I, I wouldn't say she's been a negative presence. I just think the writers have not had an appropriate plot to have a reason to have her there, even though I liked her that being there. Well, I, that's kind of what I mean. It's not that I dislike her herself specifically, but by through always having bad plots, it becomes a negative presence, you know? Sure. Because it's detracting from the show because it's we've got all these subplots that I don't care about, and sometimes they feel very tangential to what's actually I, yeah. going on. So I think the thing is with, with Lena's subplots is most of the time, J Jimmy aside, they're not actually bad subplots. They're just kind of there. So they're never bad enough for me to go, oh, this is terrible. Why am I watching this? You know, why, why are we doing Lena stuff? Again, aside from Jimmy. But I, ne I never once gone, oh, this is good. I'm excited to see what Lena's doing. No, never. I have never. <sighs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think the, the writers have had nothing for her to really do that's been worthwhile in her entire time on the show. <laughs> I think the most interesting was near the start where it was playing the will she won't be yeah. you know, be a villain. And that was, I think that was interesting. Not the plot itself of whatever she was doing at the time, but more just because whenever we were watching it, it was always a, we were trying to guess whether or not this was part of an evil plot or if it was just her doing her stuff. And that was kind of fun. Yeah, this, this show is a way of really, like... Ruining there's, everything. There's so many characters on this show who become dead weight and become frustrating to watch. You know, Jimmy 
it was perfectly likable in season one, even if we didn't like the the, the tease like potential romance, which no was the one was definitely the worst thing about season one, and they very quickly dropped it immediately, <laughs> like you know right after. No, no, this is weird, not happening. Yeah, um, like Jimmy was definitely more likable in season one, and Jimmy's actually had some good moments when they do the right thing. With him. Remember that episode last season where he he was capturing the fight as a photographer, and it felt like oh, but they're actually doing like a really good Jimmy moment here. Uh, yeah, even, that was great. Even his ending a few episodes ago, where he becomes the editor of a paper and says, "Call me Jimmy," I was like, you know what, that was a good Jimmy moment. Like this feels this feels right for him. Yeah. Um, just so much of his stuff is guarding or his subplots. Uh, Honestly, I feel this way about most, if not all, of the CW shows. Um, that I think, generally speaking, they just have too many cast members, and they don't know what to do with them all, and then people feel redundant. I think Legends has avoided this, not even though it has probably the most regular cast members. In that, it rotates through them. It like, does. Th- there's only like one or two of them left from the from the original gang now, so it doesn't feel. You know, it always feels fresh. And, in and, that. and to be it, honest, it's also replaced some of the dead weight with better characters as well. I think it recognised who you know the Hawks, for example, right. Get, get they were the first ones to go. Get them to piss, right? We don't need them. Yeah. Um, but I also think that when you look at these shows, there is this kind of problem where they do some good moments that feel like the character's a character from the comics, or at least their version of the character from the comics, where they'll do like those Jimmy moments. You know, just like on Flash, like every so often you'll get a really good Flash moment from Barry, right? But there's so much time in between where they're just a CW character, <laughs> right? Yeah. Does, does that make yeah. sense? It does. Honestly, I feel like a lot of the time when they introduce a character, they, they have an idea of an arc for that character to go through. And usually that arc is all right. They get, And then it's after that that they're like, well, we don't know what to do with them now, but we've introduced them to the show and they're a regular, so <laughs> I guess they're just here. I don't know. That's the best way I can do it is like in between the actual good comic book beats. And I think that's why like the, the crossover last year and hopefully this year will be good is because they don't hold back. They just tell a story from start to finish. Comic book beats, essentially. It's is all, what you want out of these shows. It's all comic book beats, but it's like, and it'd be easy enough to do that in an episode by episode basis. Just have, okay, we've got a, you know, a Mirror Master episode on Flash. Let's do a Mirror Master story. What can we do with it? And tell the story. But they're so obsessed with doing these these uh, long story, and I like long form story. I think you should build to big bads like hell, Buffy, the hit television show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's like sick. it built to big bads over the course of its season. It did it very effectively. But it didn't like I, I. So much of this show feels like it's trying to justify its time. I um, feel like it gets lost in the weeds a little bit because you know you're saying you're know, trying to build the overarching story. Um, it gets so caught up in just doing the overarching story that it forgets to do. You know, it, it forgets to make individual episodes fun or interesting. Yeah, it also. Just, the, the rating's just not that good on most of these shows. Like they don't know how to rate characters in compelling ways. I, I should, and you know, it's notable that even the one we really like, Legends. Although to be fair, I actually got a little bit even smarter. Dare I say, in the last season. But for the most part, the reason why we like Legends is because it just has fun with the characters, and they're just fun, you know, almost sitcom yeah, level characters. Like characters. <laughs> Sorry. Or enjoyable. They're, they're enjoyable characters to spend your time around. Yeah, but like, you know, like I. This is the thing with Doom Patrol is I actually care about those characters and they have good stories where it feels like they're going through things and learning things and having arcs. All good TV has that. And it's something that these CW shows, they just have these stagnant characters where, I mean, we've completed this a bit multiple times on Flash where Barry will literally have the same conflict with that other character. Remember, remember we was having the same argument with Ralph? for like eight episodes in a row and they felt like at the end of every episode they, they, they solved their conflict but they kept doing it again and again frankly I, I mean not to get too far ahead on flash but i feel this this conflict that well i say conflict that the barry was going through with with ralph this week is the same one he had with cisco like two weeks ago yep no that's fair, that's it, fair. it's exactly the same point it's but, just with a different character they're just rotating through what character he's doing it with yeah no, you're right. Which I, I guess is fresher than doing it with Ralph eight weeks in a row, but <laughs> <laughs> it's the same point. Or, or when Supergirl in season two, I remember we were complaining that every episode for like seven episodes ended with the exact same scene of Monel coming over Mon-El to her apartment, to the apartment yeah. and being like, oh, I'm sorry, but I really love you. Can you not like me? Oh, I'm really into you, Kara. Can we have a... I, want to, I want to put babies in you. Like, like seven episodes of... You, you just summed up at least an hour of my life. <laughs> watching all those scenes combined <laughs> and, you know like they, they all have this problem they all have this repetition where they don't actually have enough material it's, it almost feels like they're trying to justify their, their episode count and 
The weird thing is, though, is that smarter shows, this is the thing that shows like Buffy or shows like um, other shows of that era, I'm trying to, you know, like X-Files. Or... We, we, can go, we can go with things that are still technically still running that, that uh, you, you've seen enough of, I think, to, to back this up. Things like Supernatural. Sure, Supernatural, Supernatural's a good example, yeah. Uh, where what they'll do is, is that, yeah, they'll have an overall plot and they'll have, like, say, four or five key episodes throughout the season. Because this is the thing that Buffy always used to do, right? If you go back and look at season two or season three of Buffy, is you'll have an episode early on and i'm going to take season two of buffy here right because it's just a really easy one to do is episode three of buffy is the episode where spike and drusilla show up right and that introduces the main plot of the season not episode one episode three and then episodes you know like i think it, you know a few episodes later it, it, there's a couple of subplots and some episodes that remain just spike and drew are still around but it's actually episodes 10 and or 9 and 10 which were right before the mid-season break which were a big two-part in the middle they did the next chapter of the main story and then you had a couple more episodes that were kind of standalone. Again, reminded you that those characters were around, but then it was uh, the big two-part of Surprise and Innocence around uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, something in that range. And then I am a- shocked and appalled that you don't know the exact episode. <laughs> I could do it if I sit in Han. Uh, uh, <laughs> He's going through bad, all the titles. Bad, eggs, order, is tw- is bad eggs is 12. Uh, oh, God. A Surprise 13? It may actually be 13, it may be 13, 14, actually. No, it's 13, 14. Shall, shall I get this up and No, it's 13, out? it's 13, 14. I know it is. And then there's a couple more fun episodes, and then you get Passion, which is the next big episode, and then a few more standalone well, episodes. One, which, one, which one's that? Passion. Well, I don't want to spoil it, because it's a big spoiler if I just say what it is. But it's the... No, no, no. Which episode? Number? Oh, um, 17. Or 18. Okay, well, that's fine. 17 or 18. It's Passion. You try to prove if I'm right or wrong. Is it just what I see from right? Is that, is that what this is? It was, but then the list. I was like, "Why is this list not in order?" And then I realised I was. It was. It was someone's ranking of the oh, list. You and I was idiot. like, "What is it doing?" <laughs> yeah. And this one's not even numbered. Forget it. Yeah, okay. Oh no, there they are numbered. Oh. Bad eggs was twelve. Surprise was thirteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fashion was. What did you say? Seventeen or eighteen. Pick one. <laughs> so one of them's right. Hold on, hold on. Uh, so, <laughs> if Essence is 14, yeah. then you get Phases, you got Bewitched, Bald, and Bewildered. 15, 16, 17. Passion 17. It is, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you get Killed by Death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're Killed by Death. And then next would be I Only Have Eyes for You, and then Go Fish, and then Becoming Parts 1 and 2. Boom. Right. So... So yeah, because Congratulations, to, you have the order of Buffy Season 2 memorised. <laughs> the point I was getting at, though, is that you have School Hard Episode 3, you have the two-parter uh, just before the mid-season break, you have the two-parter that's just after the mid-season break, you have Passion, and then you have the two-part finale, right? So you've got, what, uh, there's one, two, three, four, so five, you know, I mean, two of them are two-parters, admittedly, or three of them are two-parters, admittedly, but you've got five chapters really in the main story of the season and sure these these main villains pop up as certain subplots here or there to remain you still around and kind of tease what's coming but there's five main chapters that theoretically you could go watch those five chapters and get the full story of season two i mean there's a lot of good episodes in between so i wouldn't recommend doing it but you can yeah right? and and there are probably many a list online that will tell you exactly that yeah and all the episodes in between there's some bad ones sure there's go fish and there's bad eggs two of the ones i mentioned there that are not very good <laughs> But, Terrible is the word you're looking for. But then you have episodes like Bewitched, Bald, and Bewildered. You have episodes like Halloween. You have these great standalone episodes that are just a fun idea that still play into the themes of the season. Because this is one of the things, if you go back and watch Buffy now with like a, a an adult mind and analytical eye, you notice that everything in the season is like playing with the themes of what the overall story is. Bad Eggs is about the responsibility of uh, what happens, you know, what can go wrong when you have sex, right? Unprotected sex, obviously it's pregnancy, right? And what's the big thing that happens in Buffy season two? Buffy has sex and it leads to something very bad, right? Obviously not pregnancy, but like... There's so much foreshadowing in those standalone episodes for what the main plot's going to do. It's really smart. I, I actually agree, because I think, um, especially uh, on Supergirl, Yeah. what the hell is the theme of this season? Because I thought the first episode, oh, this is really obvious, right? It's technology. The, and, technology, clickbait yeah. journalism. And now I don't have a damn clue what it is, because we're well, doing well, Leviathan. Yeah, it, Andrea and her making her write stuff, like, there was, like, one mention of it maybe the start of last episode, or, no, not really even last, it was one before that, because last episode didn't have any of that. Um, So two episodes ago, there was one mention, but bef- but even then, I wouldn't count that. It's really been, like, three episodes total since that's even been a factor. 
And again, this this sounds like a weird complaint after we just said they should do things, other things in between, right? Yes. But because they spent four four episodes or whatever it was setting up, this is the thing for the season, four in a row. This is what we're doing. This is our format, our structure. To then just go, ah, forget about that now. We're on something else for a bit. It kind of just feels weird. Whereas if they'd spaced out those first few. Or, you know, even just relegate them to smaller subplots and did the bigger beats still. It's funny. It, honestly, watching these shows has made me appreciate just how good the writers are on all those shows, like Buffy and Supernatural. And, you know, I mean, Supernatural had a weaker first season, but honestly, that had really good standalone episodes once it hit season two. And, like, it was a really fun show. And it, it's, it's really made me appreciate writers of other shows who know how to balance these things better and structure a season that, that doesn't feel like it's... It's it's why like uh, you know we praise legends in, not because it's that great it is basically a forty minute sitcom um, so that's kind of why it gets around a lot of these rules it's not doing all the the CW drama so it's kind of weird whereas like even Black Lightning which I think is objectively just a significantly better show than all of these other ones um, I think it has its own problems in its pacing of its season and its episodes yes yeah. Black Lightning what Black Lightning does that separates it from these other shows though is that it very much actually has more plot to keep going through it always has more plot like that's the one thing that show really has is that it always keeps going somewhere yeah which these shows do not these shows feel like they're spinning their wheels or uh, taking it, their time it really feels like like okay just, just I can't believe I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to def go in and hard and go yeah Buffy was great but yeah I, I, yeah, I know, I know. I, I've I've never had you argue with you on that. I'm just sick of you specifically, not not Buffy. Um, yeah, but this but, is the thing. Buffy is the prototype show that almost invented what the the network formula that works is, right? Because before well, Buffy, the CW formula. No, and in terms of the the hybrid, because before Buffy, it was all procedural or all just standalone episodes. Okay, sure, um, with you. Obviously, X Files started first and does a little bit of that, but X Files even more so felt like okay there's three episodes in season one that are about the main overall arcing plot and the rest are standalone but it was even more segmented and they feel separate yeah um to the point where x Files fans will tell you that the, the overall plot episodes are actually some of the weaker stuff and it's actually the really good standalone episodes that are better whereas buffy was kind of one of the first big shows that said no we can do the overall arcing plot make that really matter have the fun adventures in between I yeah. make it all click. But what was so your point here's the be? thing: in in Buffy in season two, how many? You, I know you said five chapters. How many episodes did that break down into? That were the key episodes. Three two parts, so eight eight episodes. Right, eight episodes. They had eight episodes worth of story. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and they and they went right. Well, that's eight episodes then, not twenty two. And then they went, "What are we going to do for the other 14? Yeah, fourteen. I was right. Okay. Um, I really second guess myself then. Uh, mm -hmm. What are we going to do for the other 14? Well, we'll just do other shit, won't we? Whereas these shows, they go, well, we've got maybe six episodes worth of plot. We'll get, <laughs> we've nailed that down. Let's make that last for 22. Yeah, <laughs> we'll stretch it out to 22 episodes. Uh, That's why it feels so terrible. If you condensed these things into six to eight episodes, it would probably be fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, some better rating still as well, I think, but uh, yeah. Sure, uh, uh, all right, but, you know, it would probably be much more tolerable. Yes. Um, and yeah, and again, don't don't discount the idea that even the standalone episodes did advance the themes of the season and these shows that we're and talking also about. also can just be good, enjoyable episodes in their own right. Yes, you know, like Halloween, the episode where everyone becomes their Halloween costumes. That is a fun idea. Let's just play with that. Like, I think that the closest we've had on a lot of these shows, uh, you know, not even this season, I don't think we're any, but... Going back to last year or year before, maybe um, we had Enter Flash Time. We had Arrow's Prison episode. Yeah, good episodes. But I mean, it's worth saying as well. I mean, it's, it's unfair compared to Buffy because Buffy was a show that, you know, even the standalone episodes, there was stuff to analyze, there's stuff to talk about. You know, I, I brought that Halloween episode up. You yeah. know, they all become their costumes. It's about them all kind of like. You Why know, are they those things? You know, going through their insecurities. Like you know, Buffy in the episode is wishing that she was like from Angel's time period and she becomes a woman of that time period. She becomes this weak damsel and it explores her character. Willow has self-confidence issues and she becomes this this kind of slutty ghost and she has to step up and be this this person. And there's a great, really great touch in the episode where Cordelia doesn't become her costume because she got her costume at a different shop. But what, the, what that's wonderfully saying about Cordelia is that she's who she is she doesn't lie about who she is like for for all of her faults or for, she, she might be 
slightly terrible, especially at that point. Of, yeah. Of, of, of a character. But she does kind not lie. Terrible. She does not lie yeah. about who she is. She she is who she is on the surface. There is no subtext to her. She says what she thinks and she means it. And it, it, so there's a great character stuff to analyze in that episode. And for the most part, these CW shows do not have stuff that we can analyze. We talk about how stuff's fun or bad or goofy or shit or laughably idiotic or whatever. But we don't yeah. analyze a whole lot because there's not really much to analyze. They don't have and that. Just, just for comparison, sake, you know, and we mentioned it earlier, and this, and this is incredibly unfair. Like, you know, okay, comparing it to Buffy is one thing, but Mr. Robot, right? <laughs> one episode this week, and it was you know an hour long, and we spoke ninety minutes on yes. analyzing just character, a little bit, you know, maybe ten minutes on direction and such. Yeah, but probably a good eighty minutes of just character dissection. Because that episode was literally three people in a room talking. Yes, and it was riven, and it was better than any episode that any of these CW shows have ever had. It's better than most of these combined. Like, of every episode they've ever had. My, my favourite episode of any of these CW shows doesn't even hold a candle to that episode of Mr. Robot. Oh, so, no, not, not even close. So, it's a whole different thing. It is, it's the same true with Buffy as well, to be fair. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I say it's particularly unfair. I'm not saying, oh, I expect this to be Mr. Robot level quality. Of course I don't. But we can't, we, I mean, we've probably done, I don't know, we're lucky if we talk about 30 minutes of character analysis, 30 seconds of character analysis. But there's, but there's good, there's good bubblegum stories of superheroes or shows that still work on a level that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I'm not even going to compare it to, to Dark Knight, even, like, just, even something that's fun can still have, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, like, <sighs> I mean, the boys is not a good example, but because um, that's more more sat- satirical. But like you know, like you can have just something that's really solid in doing these superhero tropes well that will function. It's I kind think- of it's kind of what Marvel has made a, a movie universe. Uh, out of. I'll tell you what, because we've got TV stuff. Barring maybe the last episode, because we haven't seen it yet. Mm-hmm. Raising Dion is kind of doing a lot of superhero tropes. Sure, and. Well, I don't think it's amazing. I don't love it. I think it's, it's, it's probably better written than most of these. It's got its problems, but yeah, it's better than DCW shows for sure. Yeah. For the most part. Um, no, that's true. Can't, can't argue with that. Umbrella Academy. Again, also has its faults, but it's better than these these shows, yeah. Yeah. Like, there was, there was character beats to talk about in that that worked and made sense and... Again, you know, it had some problems, don't get me wrong, but... Oh, honestly, overall, Umbrella Academy is a show that if you actually cut out, like, 10 minutes an episode so it could fit on TV, it may actually benefit. That, that was the main problem with that show, is every episode was probably, like, 10 to 15 minutes too long. The only downside to that is we'd have cut, like, that entire dancing scene for TV. Oh, no, I'd have left that in. I, no, no, we would have. I'd have, I'd have made a statement by leaving that in. <laughs> no, no, we would have left that in. The network would have been gone. <laughs> Screw you! You've got a three-minute dance sequence here. Take it out. No, no, that, that needs to stay. <laughs> that, that absolutely needs to stay. Um, <laughs> One of the best moments of the show, frankly. Yeah. Um, probably, well, hell, even just on the caliber of this, uh, Lois and Clark, New Adventures of Superman. Yeah. I think that show was better than ECW shows. I agree with that. Yeah, it's more fun. It's it's not wasting its time. It has goofy episodes, sure, but it doesn't it doesn't drag and repeat things the way that these shows do on a on a no, regular it, basis. It's weird that this desire to be more serialized has hurt a lot of these shows. I think because they can't pull it off. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're shooting above their weight range, and that that seems weird to say. But like, it, if they can't do it, then do something that can work and they can be good at. And, Honestly, superheroes like have so many villains. Like, yeah, I mean, have them reoccurring. I, I don't want to see them like just been one great villain after one episode. Like, have you know, have Metallo come back for more episodes. Have you know, Mixy, Mixy Pelic, Mister Mixy Pelic, Mixy Pelic, <laughs> Mixy. I call him Mixy. Mixy was safer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, have him come back for multiple episodes. But again, we got the good-looking CW Mixy, didn't we? We didn't. We didn't get the yeah. imp. <laughs> but this is the thing, like. I don't think any show can pull off a serialized story for 22 episodes a season. I mean, even the shows that we love that are fully serialized and that long, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., for example. Oh, why didn't I bring that up? Oh, actually, split that into like three stories. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a show that does not have the analysis that even a Buffy has, and uh, never made a Mr. Robot. 
but it does what it does very well with characters that make sense, have strong arcs, and just is emotionally satisfying, and you make sure you care about the characters. That is the level of quality that I want all my bubblegum TV shows yeah, to be at. I don't at. think that's too much to ask for, because that no, does that on a relatively similar budget to most of these CW yeah. shows. I mean, it feels like it anyway. Maybe I'm wrong there, but it feels on a similar th- kind of scale. I think the fact that they shoot in LA means that they do spend a bit more on it, but uh, overall, no. Yeah, but sure, but that's because they've got to pay more for that. Shooting in Vancouver is cheaper. Yes. Uh, and that's that's fine. Uh, yeah, save money there by all means. That, that's not, not... Being in Vancouver is not a problem for these shows. No, no, no. Um, so I... I just, uh, yeah, I, mean, I didn't expect a Supergirl conversation to go into why are these CW shows ultimately are kind of irritating and a failure, but this, this is why they, they ultimately have so many problems, is that they just, they don't accept what they are, and as a result, they, and it's not so much that I'm saying that they're, they're embarrassed of being superhero shows, that's not what I'm saying, I'm saying from a format perspective, they don't understand what they are. And they're trying to be something they're not, or at least something that their own writers are not capable of doing. And yeah. um, and everyone, anyone who quit Agents of Shield, you know, during season one, thinking it was bad, yeah, first first chunk of season one wasn't that good. But no, hey, hands up, I quit it first time yeah. I went through. I, I I didn't get that far. But that that last chunk of episodes of season one, season two onwards especially, is exactly the type of quality that a network superhero bubblegum show should be aspiring to. I, I think it's fair to say seasons like three and four of Ains of Shield are some of the best network TV ever made. Well, that was bold, but... Um, I think they're up there, personally. They're really high in the list. I mean, I, I, well, I mean obviously, I think Buffy's a better show. I'd say... You know, look, hey, Buffy's on that list as well. I'm not. I'm not saying Agents of Shield is better than Buffy. I mean, I'm. I might feel that, but I'm not saying. That. <laughs> um, my point was they are up there. Sure. In, in that conversation, as this is the best of what network TV can produce and can do on a standard network TV budget. Yeah, the rating's just better. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. The rating's better. Um, don't worry, there's some bad acting on some of these shows, but they also have good actors. You know, Melissa Benoist is a very good actor, and. She she has routinely in this show not been given the material deserving of her caliber. <laughs> I, no, I, I think all of these shows have some great actors. Uh, some, so, some. No, no, no. I think yeah. they all have at least one great actor on them. Uh, you know, I think Supergirl's quite lucky in that it's stacked with Benoist, uh, Charlie, uh, David Harewood is you know a fantastic actor he is uh, he doesn't get to stretch his legs much on this show but he is fantastic yeah and one when he was around as well yeah yeah exactly uh um, no they all they all do have some good actors uh it's just they don't get the material they're deserving and it's, they're not, they're it's not. And, and they they i think all of them do their best they they elevate scenes that in lesser hands would be terrible and they make them at least bearable uh, for a lot of the time. I think, like, yeah, this is the thing. The actors in a lot of these shows are good enough that they can elevate the material as long as it hits a baseline level. The problem is, is that it often doesn't even hit the baseline level. It actively frustrates the audience uh, and insults their intelligence. And yeah, I mean, I enjoy the thing is, I, I think with each passing season of these shows, it's hard not to get more and more jaded. And I feel like at this point, in we're eight seasons into Arrow, six seasons into Flash, five into Supergirl, uh, only one into Batwoman, obviously. But <laughs> um, like, yeah, we're at jaded territory here, um, and this is where we yeah. are. And, um, and it kind of it's kind of unfair to Batwoman and like you know when we get it probably next year, uh, you know, uh, Green Arrow and the Canaries. It's going to be a bit unfair to those shows that they have all this baggage coming in. I mean, let's be honest, Green and the Canaries, especially after this week, could have just been Arrow Season 9. Um, but, you know, it has this baggage that they're attached, they've, they've got the formula, and we're like, eh, okay. Yeah. Uh, someone asked in the comments, because we were debating uh, a couple of episodes ago if the next one was going to be the backdoor pilot. Um, it's like the second it's like right before the end yeah it? it's episode 9 is the, 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 the actual backdoor pilot even though I do feel like there's so much of like Mia and William are in these stories now that honestly most of the season feels like kind of a backdoor pilot in and of itself it, it feels like an actually g- legitimately organic way of setting up uh, it does. the first few episodes weren't after the, after the point where we are now it feels like no this is organically setting up honestly, that show as a spin-off uh, why I say it feels like it could have just been season 9 
honestly, these characters, since they've been in the present, they have been fine. Like, I have not hated their presence. It's all the future stuff, eh. And hey, and what we said last week, the, the, the scene with, uh, was it last week? Uh, with William? Or was that the week before? Um, no, I think it was, I think it was the last episode, yeah. Was it, yeah. When he comes um, out to his dad, yeah. That was good. Yeah. It was a good scene. One of the best scenes Arrow has had in, in like two years. And Arrow honestly is having the most interesting season out of everything right now just because it's doing, it's building to crisis and it's doing some interesting stuff. Not every episode has been good. I mean, even the ones that have, I've enjoyed haven't necessarily been good, but they've been definitely more interesting because they've been moving forward and doing something. It, there's there's a pace to Arrow that you cannot deny that these other shows would kill to have. Yeah. And notably because it's got half the amount of episodes. The, the pacing is really the killer. Anyway, we can move on to the next show, I think. But, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, sure, why not? I may have to like, put in the timestamp. It's a general conversation about the quality of the CW shows as a whole uh, yeah. at the end of the Supergirl discussion. Um because that was not Supergirl for quite a while there. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to Batwoman Season 1, Episode 7, Tell Me the Truth. Uh, the main thing here is that Sophie wants to rat out Kate to her dad, and uh, Julia Pennyworth is in is in Gotham and shows up. Uh, Extremely English, Julia Pennyworth. Yes. Um, like, aggressively English. Yeah, if it's almost like they don't trust you, just get the accent. They have to have her make all these weird references just to really hit home. Yeah, and even the accent was pretty heavy. Yeah. So, you know, it show starts with a decent scene. Uh, there was a sniper going to get, kill someone and Batwoman kind of like saves the day and takes mm. him out. And it's, it's a decent enough Batwoman scene and, and whatever. Um, we have, uh, we find out that the assassins uh, have been hired by Alice and Mouse. Uh, they're killing off the people who are behind making this this bat killer gun uh, so that no one can replicate it um and they've got this assassin working for them who also uh, later on and this is actually an interesting thing from the comics um although the name was pronounced differently than we were pronouncing it when we were talking about the comics to be fair though i'm willing to buy that we were just wrong honestly we may have been wrong but i still think sophia sounds better i think the reason why if they have changed the pronunciation is because there's a character on this called sophie which really like if anything just even using sophia feels like too close it's like what, what's funny is it was like a couple episodes ago you slipped up and said sophia instead of sophie and i said that'll be because you're familiar with a, a yeah. character called sophia from batwoman comics yeah sophia is a character from the more recent uh, rebirth batwoman comics um so it's interesting they're teasing her uh especially like this where like you know because i'm sure we'll get flashbacks uh oh, like the comic I'll had talk. <laughs> they'll love the flashbacks oh they will because we get more flashbacks in this one more of our time at military academy and like, uh just on on the flashbacks the in general like yes visually i'm so glad they dropped that janky look that it had it's it's still like filtered really bright mm. but the the first episode it was properly janky and it was horrible it's they're not as visually bad anymore it's that's, not as good but they're, they're better uh so sophie's going to do this her husband's like annoyed that she's going to tell something to major kane uh and he's he's like oh is that a husband thing should i not know what's going on do you know who batwoman is here's a photograph oh. of you talking to her why why <laughs> this guy is such a prick <laughs> yeah he's kind of a prick uh so kate is going to try and tell her or at least that's what uh julia and uh and uh, luke are saying who, who know each other by the way and they're they're quite friendly uh also in, yeah and this though julia and her and kate had like a fling once uh, yeah as if you couldn't tell from the very first line they said to each other oh sure but what i mean is in the comics that wasn't a thing uh no, that wasn't. yeah also I mean, that doesn't bother me though yeah isn't because was tuxedo a thing in the comics because I, I seem to remember penny because no, it was penny, she was two. penny two yeah uh, so, but here was was it tuxedo one tuxedo one yeah i, was like, no, no, I appreciate two. that they kept the one thing at least yeah uh, so she goes uh, to the restaurant because there was a whole thing in TV where the owner of the restaurant, where the, the victim of the sniper uh, was, said, oh, Batwoman can come and eat here for free at a time. Now, she doesn't actually take up on that offer because she's obviously not going to reveal she's Batwoman. But she's eating in that restaurant uh, with Sophia and the owner gets all homophobic and... Sophie. Sophie, sorry. <laughs> See, I told you this is a problem. <laughs> I told you this was going to be a problem. <laughs> right. So she's with Sophie at the restaurant uh, to tell her, you know, whatever. And... Um, you know, they've got drinks and the owner is all like, he makes up and it's just, oh, those sneakers aren't, uh, you know, to the dress code. And, you know, Kate kind of calls him out on it and makes a bit of a scene um, about, you know. 
because at, at first you, you, you're kind of like i mean i guess there is a dress code in a place like this but then she immediately points out hey that guy's wearing you know sneakers yeah and then uh, it's like oh okay i get what they're doing now and i and presumably she's good at like noticing that because this is not the first time she's had this kind of uh yeah. targeting um yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it's because it's a really posh restaurant, but I mean, that's, what's weird to me about this, not not from how they handle it from Kate's perspective of view, I actually, I actually kind of like her making a fuss, and I kind of like, and I, you know, because it does a bit of the character stuff where Sophie just wants to like, kind of accept it, and let's not make a scene. Just but, because, that really does actually lean into everything we know about her, especially thematically, I think the flashbacks work in relevance to this. In yeah, this and you know, the idea that Kate, you know, because there's a whole flashback where we see that it's actually Kate's dad who... Because Sophie actually is going to like stand up and say, no, I'm not going to sign it. But it's Kate's dad who sits and goes, no, if you do that, you'll you get kicked out. And I'm not saying, I'm not making the choice for you, but here's what's going to happen. And she's like, why aren't you, have, why aren't you having this speech with Kate? He's like, because I know my daughter, and no matter what I say to Kate, she is going to go in there guns blazing because that's who she is. She will never back down. And, and she will be getting kicked out. And, yeah. and he's like, she's already accepted that. Kate knows this yeah. already going into that fight. She knows she's not going to win, but she's going to do it anyway. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's raising an interesting question of like swallowing your, your pride, essentially, because you want the you want the benefit because in this case she she wants to have this education she wants this career for herself and she's making a choice to to give up the fight now so she can get where she wants to go and maybe fight later or, or whatever. Right? It's this idea of like swallowing your pride to get what you want. You know, something, something that actually Brooklyn Nine-Nine did really well uh, with Holt and the idea of his past and like getting yeah. where he is as captain and like, and that's a sitcom that actually handles those topics really well. So I'll give the show credit. I actually think that scene is played really well for showing who the two characters are in this scene um, and really well. The, the point I was going to bring up though is that I've had dinner with another guy before, right? <laughs> Just because we both wanted to get food. Sure, in, yeah. In restaurants. Not, like, super high dining, but, like, you know, where, where there's a waiter, and you get a check, and you're sitting at a table together, and no one, no one assumes that you're gay. <laughs> they just assume that you're two guys having dinner. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, I actually wonder what my reaction would be if someone did assume that and tried to like mistreat us because of it. I w I I would I'd be, I'd be very curious to, as to how I'd play it because I would like obviously said like well I'm not Let's gay. Honest, you'd go oh, I'm not, and then that'd be the end of it. Yeah, but I would be offended. Yeah, probably. Because but you wouldn't. So what? You, like, reality, you probably wouldn't actually think about it that much because you don't have to. <laughs> If I had to say the sentence I'm not gay to get the guy to leave us alone, I think I think I'd feel a bit weird about it. It's fair enough. Because if you yeah. actually have to say it out loud, I'd feel kind of weird. Like, oh, I'm not gay. As if that gets me out of this. As if it's, oh, then it's okay. Then the guy would be like, oh, yeah. it's fine then. Like, I'd feel yeah. really weird about that. I'd be like, uh -huh. I'd feel like I just like whipped out a straight privilege card or something stupid like that. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like I'd feel uncomfortable. So, uh, yeah. so. I mean in, in this, I do wonder if part of it is, is her look, you know, in, in the sense that mm. she looks like what a lot of people assume a gay woman might look like, right? Yeah, the short With hair. The haircut yeah. and the colour. And, um, so I wonder if that's why the manager is is making that assumption as well. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Uh, it could just be that I have never dined in a place quite as fine dining as this. <laughs> and this is, a, you know, a, yeah, a lot yeah, more snooty. You're not as rich as she is. Yes. <laughs> well, she's Bruce Wayne's cousin. Look, this didn't actually look that nice a place. Like, True. It looked, yeah, it looked fine. It looked it looked like a perfectly average, you know, maybe slightly above average restaurant, right? Yeah. Um, it looked pretty normal. Uh, it didn't look stupidly expensive, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe my perception of restaurants is off. Look, ultimately, what I'm doing here is is like I I can't say this is isn't realistic because I'm sure I'm sure it happens still. Um. But I I just uh, maybe I just live in a good place where no one assumes that immediately. They just assume it's no. people out for dinner. Well, yeah, maybe. Um, maybe you're in a more tolerant area. But I mean, here, here's the thing, though, as well. It's not even like there was any public display. You know, they weren't even like, holding hands or anything. Yeah, that, 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 literally that, two people sat at a table. I think that's why why I thought this. It'd be one thing if they were holding hands, and that's why he's like, oh, I can't have this. There's, 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 gay, didn't, there's gay things happening in my restaurant. I can't, <laughs> can't have this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but like, they are just sitting talking, and it's not even like a romantic looking setting you know one of them sitting in like a like you said maybe it is just kate's look more than anything but it was just it was an interesting because it was making me think how i'd how i'd react to this because i have been i've been out for meals before with guys and obviously they've, they've not been dates because it's just two guys going for some food <laughs> like yeah it happens like yeah. it happens i'm sure all the time with the two girls just go for some food exactly friends friends tend to go yeah. hey you know should we get some lunch if anything girls going for lunch days with each other is way more of a common thing than than men doing it 
Yeah. Oh, it is loads. Yeah. So yeah, presumably yeah, he's probably just judging her on her look more than anything else. But which uh, I th- I I think I will say is plausible enough that I can buy it that people assume this on her look. Sure. Just uh, yeah, just because of the what that's what the public image or perception is to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, so I'll give the scene this. He got us talking a lot about various things. Uh, it got me thinking about perception and how how people are treated like this in public. Because it made me think, well, how would I react if someone assumed this about me? And yeah. then... I, I, honestly, I think it helps this show that a lot of this is so baked into just the core of the show that, you know, you know it's not like Supergirl has had some great episodes on like this topic with Alex, for example. Mm-hmm. And those have been great episodes of that show. But they are, here's an episode about it. Whereas with with Batwoman, you know, with with Kate, this is every day of our life, and we are and because she's the title character, we are seeing this a lot. Yeah, I think th- this scene again does a good job of kind of like giving an example of something that she does have to put up with, and why she does have kind of a against the rules kind of attitude. You know, it's like because our, the rules are constantly beating her down, the people within those rules are constantly mistreating Even her. Even down to you know, like you know, like you know, I say how she dresses like the archetype. Is almost like a statement of it, from it, her going, "Oh no, this is what I am." It's to provoke. It's, it's almost provocative to be like, "Hey, no, you have to be okay with this and deal with it." Yeah, yeah. That and from Kate Kane, I definitely buy that. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. It fits some of the characters. Maybe the most Batwoman thing about her, uh, yeah. honestly, in the show. So, um, I guess credit to the scene. I, I mean, the guy is talking about a lot of different things. It made me think about uh, yeah, this type of situation because obviously, you know, the 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 conversation itself was. Was fine. It wasn't, you know, where, where it was going, but it never even got to any tedious love triangly bits because this cut in and was way more interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was love triangly bits later in the episode, and yeah, those you know, bits weren't so hot. Yeah, it seems with other people, but, but th- this scene, love yeah, triangly bits are never that hot, are they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this scene was fairly well handled, and yeah, mm-hmm. so but uh, good, 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 good show, I suppose. Uh, uh, obviously, because of the interruption, though, uh, the conversation never quite happens, and. Sophie actually does go to uh, Kane and is like, "Hey, uh, your daughter's Bat Batwoman. We have to stop this weapon that's going out uh, and about that may kill her." And it's like, "Okay, so this feels like a big moment." Uh, and which but, is, is undermined a little bit later on. Well, yeah, because the, the, the twist is that he's not been around the whole episode because we find it because we knew he was away looking into a lead uh, upstate. Is yeah. what they keep telling us. I mean, we assume, and we assume I did that... chuckle at first because it felt like a CW excuse to get him out of the episode. Yeah, but it's, it's more of a plot thing here because he's actually going to be back at the end of the episode and we find out that what, the person we've been seeing all episode as Jacob Kane is actually a mouse. He whips off the mask and the hair and it's him. And it's like, okay, neat little trick. I mean, I'm not entirely sure what they accomplished. The only thing they really say in this scene when he reveals this is that, oh, Catherine, because he's going to get a divorce from Catherine as Jacob. And in this scene, it's like, oh, Catherine thinks they're on good terms again. They've made up. So... Uh, presumably, they're going to figure out quite quickly that those were ruse because it's not going to be that long until he gets back and then Catherine's like, oh, I'm glad we're all happy with each other again. He's like, what are you talking about? I still hate your guts. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and she was like, but yesterday when we were talking, she was like, he was like, I wasn't even here yesterday. Yeah, so presumably it has to kind of come up at some point soon, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we find out that Sophia is behind the, the person trying to get this 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 weapon and kill Batwoman, and we find out that Alice actually saved her by not putting in the full dose of the the fuel or the the cartridge or whatever it is. Yeah, she'd emptied half of it uh, so it wasn't the full blast. Um, but of course, it wasn't actually Kate that it hit because they, they, we do we get the classic. We're going to trick uh, Sophie into thinking that Kate's not Batwoman by having like, like Julia else in the suit yeah. be Batwoman, and. You know, credit where credit's due, because of the wig and the, the makeup and the mask and whatever, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm not actually sure if they had the actress who plays Julia in the mask, or if they just had Kate, the, you know, had Ruby Rose play both roles, and just tell us it was Julia, because it looked convincing. I'd have to go back and look, but, yeah, I, like I say, I think her mask actually does a good job of hiding most of the face, it does, unlike yeah. some other superhero masks, and then, like you say, you add on the wig and the voice changer. What you mean, like yeah. elongated man who was at a press conference this week on Flash with just that stupid eye mask? Oh, oh we'll get there. <laughs> so I, I have many a Twitter-based thoughts on Flash. I'm, yes. gonna, I'm just going to scroll through my thread and see what I thought at the time. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So, so I mean, the the crow, the crows actually nab uh, Batwoman at first, and then 
Uh, Kate has to come and rescue Kate her. Kate comes and rescue her as Kate on the motorbike. And, you know, so seemingly she's kind of convinced Sophie that she's not Batwoman for now. It's one of those weird things, though, because as, as you know, uh, as Batwoman is taken away, she turns to Sophie's like, do you trust me? Right, give me your gun. I'm going to go save her. <laughs> and that probably immediately goes, hang on a second. <laughs> yeah. Although we do, we do say that she knows she's well trained because uh, we, we see her in the flashbacks that she was really good at the shooting range and she got a medal and all the rest of it because uh, Sophie gives her the medal by the end. She patches up with her husband and has a big heart to heart and explains everything to him. Uh, didn't really like those scenes too much. I do kind of like... Um, like, because I think Mary's kind of a fun character. She doesn't have a lot in this episode, but when she comes into it, she almost catches uh, Luke, Kate, and Julia all going out of the Batcave. And she's like, oh my god, you've got a secret door. It's like, oh yeah, shut it, it quickly. A safe room. <laughs> safe room, yeah. You've you, you got a safe room. And Mary thinks she's being kind of, you know, the Kate's trying to distance herself and doesn't care that they're, they're kind of, their family's breaking apart with the divorce and all that. Uh, but Kate at the end sort of like brings her in because she's she's bought a like she's meant to be in real estate <laughs> like that's her cover right now, and yeah. she's bought a place across from that restaurant so she can open a gay bar as an fu to the manager. That's pretty uh, funny. Uh, that's pretty funny. And Mary's like, oh, I guess I'm on designing. I'm, I'm designing everything. That's my my role. And she's like, yeah, sure. So it's just kind of like accepting her as a sister, as a friend, to sort yeah. of keep her humanity because she can't be Bruce and like sort of have everyone you know be disconnected because that was that's yeah. you know Bruce's thing um and i thought that was an okay point to make i mean i don't think it was a great episode but i actually thought that it did enough solid story things with the characters Even, it has enough moments doesn't yeah it? i i mean i thought julia as an entity i mean she wasn't bad but i didn't really think she added anything to the episode either she was um basically just kate but british <laughs> In the sense of, here's the flirty badass. Yeah. Um, but with an English accent instead. I mean, she's fine. But, you know, she's enjoyable enough to watch. She's got chemistry with them. You know, and I, I think I'll say that again. I think Alice is actually a pretty decent villain. And I think I've been, I think her, her performance has grown on me. I think it's still not quite like it is in the comics, but it's grown on me more for what it is. Uh, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. And I like that we're setting up. Sophia or Sophia as they're saying you know that is okay there is something bigger and that because I think we were speculating I think last week it was like well why does she want the gun because as she said she already knows who she is she could just kill her anytime she doesn't need to for her to be in the suit and we thought oh maybe it's about the symbol but the idea oh no no there's third parties and that she's actually keeping her alive by yeah. killing all the people who could have actually killed her in the suit before giving them the broken gun yeah for all for all the murdering she's doing she's actually doing it to help kate like it is helping kate ultimately you know in, in a weird roundabout way oh, yeah i can i can follow her twisted logic to it yeah. is, is the point so that that makes sense for motivation so yeah it's good i, I really hope we're past the the sophie love drama because uh, it's definitely oh, we're definitely not blandy mcblanderson's still alive <laughs> because I, I really like yeah, it is definitely the weakest part of the show um but you know again i, I think between this and the, the, the episode with the elevator stuff um which i also relatively enjoy and even the, even the flashback stuff was okay you know with the you know her alice growing was... up with the Oh, that stuff, yeah. Uh, just in I the sense the that... Uh, oh, the flashbacks this one were okay. Like, you know, when... It was a bit cheesy and on the nose, but when, when uh, after the, the breakup and the flashback, when Sophie comes in and the guy's taking down Kate's medal out of the, the cabinet, because she's not... Yeah, I thought of... it was just a bit much of an outburst. That, yeah. Like, she'd been such a reserved character that this kind of felt out of character. I, I like the scene with Jacob talking to her, uh, kind of setting that up. Yeah, that scene was good. I, I, I think... Uh, you know, it's still a mixed bag, but I think there's enough things happening that are right. I mean, this is true for a lot of these earlier CW shows, and all the good stuff like goes away over time, and it just ends up in the bad right. stuff. I think it goes back to what I was saying in, in that last discussion, in that they have arcs for characters in mind at the start, and they can get through that. They can do those arcs, and usually those arcs can be done pretty well. I think but once they're done. I think my concern is that okay, so we've got Alice, and we're setting up Sophia. I'm going to say it their way to try and help differentiate from Sophia, or from Sophie, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, 
they're setting her up and i think that will be a season one thing i think because we've got 22 episodes because you know we're still early on i think they're, we're definitely going to do that stuff in season one it does make me a little bit concerned that when we get to season two we've used all of batwoman's villains <laughs> so what are we doing and then? we're on to batman stuff yeah which could probably. be fine i mean you know i mean hell they could do they could do some good stuff they could they could bring harley on as a villain for example and do some great yeah, like stuff they're gonna that. be allowed that, <laughs> that said though that may be too close to alice and it's like you know it's a crazy chick kind of thing i, I think season two villain i think you have to go a completely different route do you know who i think would be a really interesting thing for batwoman to do uh, on the show mm -hmm. uh two-face okay yeah i, 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 I can see you know if, if you start by introducing harvey dent and kind of do it gradually because again a compliment to this show is you know we were talking about the the pacing of when the big episode and reveals are uh, in in the, the last discussion and while this show is still way more serialized than you know, Buffy or anything like that ever was. You know, it is every episode is kind of the next chapter and is important. I appreciate that it is episode seven where we're only just introducing, uh, you know, Sapphire as a concept. Uh, yeah. As, oh, oh, just tease that as oh, there is something else out there. We've dealt with Alice for six episodes, and I'm glad that we're not stretching Alice out for twenty two or just Alice out for twenty two. I should say. Yeah, but well, I don't think Alice is ever going to go away. I think we're going to have Alice maybe become better and be Beth again at some point or whatever. Like she's, she's always going to be present. But I think so far I'll commend it the fact that all of Alice's stuff so far has been decent little subplots that feel like it's building to whatever she's doing. It, none, none of it so far has felt like just a plot for a plot sake, so that Alice is there. Yeah, and then like I said, it's okay. Now we're at episode seven, and we're just introducing the idea of oh, there's more out there that are, you know, obviously we've had smaller little things each episode, but there's something bigger. There's a it's handling a real... it's, it's handling its overall plot better than the other shows typically do. It's definitely yeah. So yeah, so credit where credit is due, but that is has, uh... has, has this had the back nine ordered yet? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I felt I thought we spoke about it, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, it's got a back nine, so this is a 22 episode season, uh, meaning that it'll probably be that again in season two, because they typically keep them consistent. Other than Legends. I feel like this is going to replace Arrow, and then maybe, I mean, maybe Black Canary, or Green Arrow and the Canaries uh, will be a 22 one as well, but I could see that being maybe the shorter 13 to 16 uh, range. Yeah. And this will be the 22 that replaces Arrow, but I mean... Whatever, doesn't really matter. Well, that'll take us on to The Flash, Season 6, Episode 6. It's called License to Elongate. And... I, I love this episode. <laughs> I think they went a bit far with the James Bond uh, references, quite frankly. Oh. oh, oh, it was... Uh, when we had a character called January Galore, I was like, all right, okay, you're already on the nose. You've got the music stings. Yeah. When it got to them literally quoting Goldfinger... And Ralph going, hey, that's straight out of Goldfinger. I was down in the drink, frankly. Uh, the, the villain, the villain, so you know, so James Bond villain, Bond, Bond villainy. Um, you have, I think, I almost I was okay with how on the nose it was to a point, like you know, because I, I did like the joke where they're talking to the villain for the first time and pl pretending to be nice, and you know, Ralph's like Dimney, Ralph Dimney, and then it goes to Barry, and he's like, I can do that, Alan. Barry, and then the villain just cuts him off and goes, Alan Barry, nice name. And they just move on. I appreciate that joke enough that I let them all go to that point. The one that I didn't like is that when Barry eventually does something right at the end of the episode and he goes, it's Alan, Barry Allen. I, was like, oh, I didn't need the payoff, all right? There was, no one cared for him to get it out properly by the end of the episode, all right? Yeah, Shut I up. Know. Shut up. Okay, so Ralph is investigating the disappearance of sue and it's traced it to midway city and uh this uh this party for all these these criminals all these you know big budget criminals and there was a picture of someone in a dress that she had yes that was a very fancy rare dress and maybe have been one of a kind so barry goes with them because barry wants him to be back in central city the next day because they're giving him a medal in front of the press to kind of like signal that elongated man is the, the successor to the Flash, should the Flash not be here soon, which obviously is expecting to be the case. And, which, by the way, all of this is going to feel like a waste of time when Barry somehow survives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you know what was really weird about this thing for me, though? Barry mm -hmm. was like, they need to, the, the exact phrase, I believe, was, you know, the, they'll know that the elongated man is the sole protector of Central City. I'm like, man, where does, where does Shaft kill a frost or, or Vibe? <laughs> yeah, well, Vibe's retired now, so... For now, for <laughs> there'll, there'll be a cure for his powers at some point, or Crisis but, will just do it. It's just I, I felt like 
Man, where's Shaft the rest of your team? I know, I know, so weird. Uh, so they go in and they, they have you know tuxedos and they're being all nice. Barry's terrible at it. Ralph's actually quite good at it. Um, I, I actually did chuckle um, when uh, when Ralph goes up to talk to the to the woman uh, over at the table early on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just after he's you know done the thing with the camera tie, and uh, you can just see Barry in the background. Get, you know, there's someone comes around with a plate of like little food and he, he eats it, and he's and then he's in the background finding it terrible. Mm-hmm. Just this, this again. This is all just in the background while Ralph's doing his bit, and again it was just okay. Look how out of place he is. I thought that was quite funny. Yeah, that's okay. There were some funny moments in this one. Um, honestly, this episode is kind of it feels largely pointless because there's a whole subplot with that the guy that accidentally made a portal, right? Who wakes up? Chester. Chester. There you go. And there's a whole subplot with him and Cecile, where Cecile's not got enough clients yet, so she's bored, so she wants to help him, like, ask a girl out. And there's a whole, this is a whole subplot in this episode, a character we barely know, and Cecile, trying to ask this girl out, and her, for him to get his confidence back. And, honestly, it got pretty funny at points, but at the same time, it was like, what was the point of this? What are we doing with this guy? Like, is he going to be important later? Like, because we're spending so much time on him here, it feels like he has to be. Yeah. Yeah, he's got to be coming back. It was kind of weird how Iris was missing for most of the episode. Uh, however, we did get a subplot with uh, Allegra and uh, and Wells and Nash. I'll say, I'll say oh, Nash. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it was a fine subplot, and it was more relevant because it was to do with trying to get to the monitor and you know all that stuff. But it was it was kind of weird how we had all these weird plots this episode, and it felt like a lot of the main cast were missing for. I no I reason. feel like Barry is going to be very annoyed at Nash because he didn't get to whip his own cowl off. Uh, <laughs> yes, because Nash just tells Allegra everything. Like, hey, yeah, Barry Allen's the Flash. He's like, wait, what? Uh, ba- my boss's husband is the Flash. What? What? Multiverse? He's he's just telling her everything so that she'll help him with her superpowers to like find out where he can dig it around. It is. Here's a crash course in the in the show up to now. Go. Yeah, because the monitor is apparently hiding underground on this earth, uh, behind this fancy wall. Uh, that he has to dig through, but he has to avoid all the special parts of it <laughs> otherwise it'll make an explosion that'll be huge the traps the booby yeah, traps the booby traps uh so they're doing that um so it's interesting that in flash he's trying to find the monitor to 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 stop him and in, in arrow we've actually got the team trying to figure out a way to kill him and get the parts to kill him it was interesting that there's a bit of symmetry there which is i guess yeah. nice honestly uh, this episode for me was the perfect level of of what i want from drunk watching where it's not so terrible that it's just tedious. It's doing its shtick with the Bond stuff that I was, ha- yeah, I'm, I'm having fun with the referencing because it because I was drunk at this point. Let's be honest. I wouldn't call it a good episode, but at least it was just doing a fun, silly side thing and was mostly just enjoying itself as it was doing it. Like for example, um, like in, when Barry cracked a joke about Mortal Kombat, he said, "Oh, I like Mortal Kombat," but because he, he's talking to uh, what's her face, Ultraviolet, the villain who happens to be there as a henchman for the bad guy, and she's got that mask on. She looks kind of like like Katana or someone from Mortal Kombat, and he says, "Yeah, hey, I like Mortal Kombat." I actually laughed out loud because I thought, you know what, she does look like she's from Mortal Kombat. That's actually not a bad reference. Yeah. Uh, but then he kind of awkwardly goes like, "Yeah, how does it go? Finish him." And he does like, "I was like, okay, Barry, you're taking it too far. You're taking it too far." <laughs> So you're all. I, I was cheering at this point. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you know the problem with the, the plot of this is that it does that really obvious Flash thing where it sets up the lesson that Barry's supposed to learn that, that Ralph's actually quite good at this. And in the just, first, like, 30 seconds. It, it sets up in the first 30 seconds. So when Barry goes against what he says, puts on his Flash suit, and does it as the Flash, and it's immediately... It's just frustrating. It just, it's just frustrating because you know exactly what it's doing. He's going to get them caught and ruin the whole plan so that it'll prove that Ralph is right and he'll have to do things Ralph's way. And it's kind of the reverse of what happened when Barry was trying to teach Ralph, like, two seasons ago. You know? It's kind of just yeah. the reverse of that. Uh, but, but, of course... It's, it's... It's funny though that this is kind of like a prime example of, hey, just a side episode doing its own thing. If you take out the reason why Barry is doing this, as to yeah, you know, because he's not going to be there. If you just go, well, Barry decided he was going to go help a help a case, you know, with Ralph because he had a quiet week. Yeah, this would be a, a you know a perfect little just side episode. Yeah, uh, the problem is it's just, it's just not that great. Like that's the yeah. the real issue. Well, I mean, it. hey, but it's great if you're drunk. <laughs> 
So um, that's basically it. They catch the bad guy because yeah, they're, they're auctioning off a missile satellite that can, you could say, although notably only has five rockets on it and they're using one for a demonstration, which is actually one thing that really bothered me about this is the coincidental nature of the fact that had Joe not given Ralph this tip that maybe this dress showed up at this place and this criminal was there, Central City would have got nuked because that's what was happening in this demonstration. They were only just there by happenstance to to you know to to investigate this this party in this auction and what was happening had they not been there for this other case central city would be wiped off the mat and all the main characters would be dead i'll be fair felicity would have redirected it to new havensville <laughs> she's in hayden now she's not doing that anymore <laughs> yeah no um, uh, again such a bond villain plan um uh, but yeah, no, massive coincidence. Yes. Uh, so yeah, we had the subplot with Cecile uh, and her sort of getting her mojo back because uh, the, the whole thing is that she's trying to help him ask this girl out by like reading her feelings, but she's actually just saying her own kind of. Uh, you know, she's like, hey, she's insecure. She wants to be reassured. So tell us something nice about her shoes. Um, and she's she's wearing these like filthy old sneakers that like clearly she doesn't care about. This is just work shoes. Yeah. Um, and she's delivering the coffee. Um, and he ends up spilling coffee all over. It's vaguely amusing, uh, and that's basically it. It's, uh, it's tolerable, is is how I would describe it. Yes, uh, Allegra's whole thing is that she doesn't want to use her powers because she's worried that I'll make her evil. But Nash convinces her, no, you're not your cousin. You're you can be yourself and use your powers for good. And she uses her powers, and it gives them the right you know place to put things. Um, the only unknowable thing is at the very end of the episode, Bloodwork shows up because of course he does. And takes a dive uh, at Ralph. Uh, I mean, we skipped over the actual medal thing because basically, in getting this medal uh, as elongated man, uh, he's basically said to Joe, "Hey, we have to congratulate Barry as Barry and not as Flash to let him know that Barry's also important." Um, so they, they give Barry a little speech in the press conference, and um, it's a perfectly nice little moment. Yeah, and Joe, you know here's the thing: if I believed for one minute that Barry was gone in crisis. I think I would like this quite a lot. It would feel like or an actual, they're, they're saying goodbye, this is a farewell. But because we're like, well, it's not going to be, it, it all feels just a little bit hollow and like, we're just going to go through yeah. the motions because of course that's what the characters are going to think. And if only I hadn't better. already seen the uh, this done better on the hit television show, Buffer the Vampire Slayer. The prom, if you recall. I recall. Yes, you do. It was memorable because it was well written, you see? That's how it works. Hey, this is going to be memorable for all the James Bond references. <laughs> when 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 you say, oh, what happened in that one? And I go, well, yeah, it was that episode where, where Barry got on it. And you go, oh, which one was that? I don't remember. Like, oh, it's, it's the James Bond episode. You go, oh, yes, the James Bond episode, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this episode is much longer than I was expecting it to be because we spent so long uh, deconstructing the CW shows as a whole. We have kind of babbled a bit and, yeah. Um, but hey, we're on to uh, Arrow. So yes, this we is, are. This is a uh, season eight, episode five. It's called Prognost. I'm assuming that's a Russian word. <laughs> yeah, it'd be Prognost, wouldn't it? So like that Prognost. Um. So, yeah, they're looking into building their their device to cre- recreate the uh, antimatter wave. They're not calling it that yet, but I mean that's. We, we know that from yeah. comics. Uh, and they're like, okay, we need this d- design plan, but we also need plutonium. Uh, and as soon as they said plutonium, like, what do you mean, like, nuclear weapons? I'm like, get Felicity on the show. She she, she could find <laughs> nukes. That's her speciality. So, uh, Connor's looking after himself and his family, I think. He was, he was, he's, I think that's what Diggle said he was off doing. I don't remember what he was doing. He's just not here. Yeah. And Diggle's like, oh, I've got someone else in mind to help me to get the plutonium. So he's he's off in a two-man job. And he goes to Roy, who's pretending to be like Joe, the mechanic or whatever. <laughs> and he's like, hey, in the future, we find out that you you were in isolation on Lian Yu, but you eventually learned to like work with a team and save the city. So just, just come back to the team, and that's what keeps you going. And then there's a whole conversation where they say bloodlust like three times. Oh, my God. This destroyed me. You've got a bloodlust. Like, it's been a while. It's been a while. A blood lust. The, the last time and, was the episode Roy was in last season when he had the bloodlust and he killed the guy. Yep. Yeah, um, again, I may have cheered. This is why I was basically blackout drunk come Supergirl. Because we got free <laughs> bloodlusts and I was downing whiskeys every time. Because them's the rules. I don't make the rules. 
because blood I mean, lust. Well, not anymore. We made them a long time ago. This has been a rule for such a long time that. More honestly, most of this plot is just them waiting for this truck to show up, and they're having these conversations. Oh, um, it's so boring. And then eventually they, they, do, they do the fight. Roy does punch a guy a few times too many. Diggle pulls him off and says, you're okay, you're okay, and talks to him. He's like, yeah, and he calms down. And it's like, yeah, so he's like, I'm going to stick around on Team Arrow. So I guess he's around now for the rest of the season in Crisis, yeah. which is fine, whatever. F- mm. feels weird that, that Thea kind of popped in for one episode and then left, but Roy's sticking around. Yeah, because the actress probably just only wanted to agree to one episode. Um she I mean, was like, nah, you treated me like shit for four seasons. It's kind of nice that every main character, for the most part, seems to be coming back for one episode to just sort of say hi before the end of the show. It's one of those things that I could see why it's annoying and a little bit formulaic, but eh, end of the show. Even, even if it, I haven't liked most of the show, if you reach this sort of length, you get to celebrate your own existence like that. The real question, though, does Ragman come back for that episode? They mentioned, um, what was it in Flash? Um, the contortionist dude. Not Ragma, obviously, but... Uh, oh, Ragdoll. Ragdoll, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, I wonder if they'll get Ragma back. They kind of forgot about him. I, I was, as I was watching that. I, then... I did like the end flash uh, when, when Devney's like, talking about some of the people at the party. He mentions one of them is from Bratva. And I thought, oh, that's a nice little touch. Yeah. One's from the yeah. Bratva. Uh, so, that was the side mission. The main mission, of course, is uh, Oliver takes Mia and William along with uh, Laurel... Uh, who's on maybe our double-sided mission to like get the plans first for the monitor uh, to to Russia? So they go to Anatoly, who's got a bar now, and honestly, he's as suave as ever. Yeah, everything with Anatoly is like even at the end when they're saying goodbye, he's like, "Oh, we're brothers now. That's not let's forget bygones are bygones. You know, we're allies. That's that's not." He's, pretend he's always else. had yeah. You know, again, this is one of those things where it comes down to the actors rather than the writing. Mm. He's always had a charm that he can pull off this shit. Yeah, uh, I will say I did laugh out loud. So they're, they're talking about where they might find this guy, and they mention like a, a fight club. And William says, "Oh, kind of like where I first met Mia." And I was like, "What?" He's <laughs> like, "Well, I had to make some money, and I could fight." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, "My daughter was in a fight club. What the hell?" Um, <laughs> and uh, so, and he gets really skittish about them being there to see him go to the fight club, and he, he goes into a fight. Uh, Mia even sees him because they kind of show up unwanted. Uh, which does get her kidnapped along with Oliver uh, because the Bratva show up and aren't happy that this guy who had the the uh, the the hard drive or whatever it is that's got the the plans on it. Um, so they get they get kidnapped and we get the whole ringing the bell thing. They make Mia uh, do the fight to ring the bell and she just doesn't make it by a second. Like she's just reaching for it when the time's up. It's close. Yeah. Um, and you know the episode's kind of about Oliver like trusting her to be herself and be a fighter, and you know eventually he does sort of say, "Oh yeah, you know what? I need your help. Let's go tag team the cage. <laughs> Let's do a tag team fight club match." Um, yeah. And and you know a lot of this episode is again just setting her up as the Green Arrow as a successor. You know Anatoly's like, hey, "Yeah, she's definitely your daughter." Yeah, and stuff like that. I think what I liked about this is that they sold that he's still better than her right now. She's still making some mistakes and looks a bit but more vulnerable. Young. But she, it does set up the idea that she's still getting out of it. She's still a fighter. Um, I, I liked the bit at the start, actually, when she's training. And he does the, the, the tennis ball thing. He, he, he launches the tennis ball. And he's like, hey, you have to hit it right in the middle. or Otherwise, it'll, it'll repel it rather than, you know, pin it. And she, you know, he launches a ball. And she like, hits it. And goes, well, that, that was meant to be hard. He's like, no, that was the warm-up. And then he just like throws, like, you know, five or six balls. And But that was the thing we saw back at the start of the show. Is he would do that. He would do, like, lots of balls. It, it was that and the salmon ladder. Yeah. Um, she's not done that yet. Oh, it's coming. It may be coming. I, I'm telling you, episode nine, she's salmon laddering. <laughs> That's when we know the, 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 the torch has been passed. And I'll be honest, I, honestly, the stuff with Oliver and his kids, I actually mostly think it's okay. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not like super like great in terms of, you know, it's still CW caliber of great, but I think the, really, the chemistry with him and his kids and them kind of like joking that they don't know about his time on Russia, like you like, you were in the Bratva, and like at the end when there's like, okay, what do you want to know? Well, hey, we don't know much about this island you were on. And you know what kind of like the camera pulls back as he's telling Honestly, most of that stuff is working well enough for me. Like it's it's not bad. No, I agree. And it is amazing. Truly astonishing how much better these two are in the present day. Oh yeah. Like I I cannot get over like well, no, I, I can tell you. I can tell you exactly what it is. I can tell you right now what it is. The the plot in the future was plot for plot's sake because they wanted to try and justify having it. 
this plot now is because because Oliver's actually leaving, you know, whatever, you know, whether he becomes Spectre or dies or, or whatever we're doing, right? He's actually leaving the show as ending, and because of that, it's allowed to actually advance things because they don't have to maintain a status quo. They're allowed to actually wrap things up and make it feel like it has a fi- fin- fin- finality. Finality, thank you. That's what I was going for. Yeah, um, I, I, um, I could see you struggling. I thought, I'll give you a hand because I want to get my next point. Um, yeah, yeah. This is the key difference between this and The Flash this season, is that when Arrow is doing these ending things and we're saying goodbye to Oliver Queen, we believe it because we know it's happening. Right, so it, it it has weight to it. Maybe it's not all earned weight, but in, it, it it deserves to exist in its own right. Whereas you know Oliver setting up his successor, in, which is what he's doing here, <clears throat> feels like the thing that he should be doing, and it feels like okay, this has meaning because he does need a successor. Barry setting up his successor, not so much. Yeah, dare I say, um, it's doing the stuff with the, the kids fairly well to the point where I'm actually more optimistic than I should be, probably, for their show. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Cause... I, I, I think it's played it off well enough. I, I like, uh, like Anatoly meeting them and kind of cracking jokes about it being his kids. And um... It's funny, I think, you know, even for like, during, like, the, the really terrible seasons, I, I enjoyed, like, uh, you know, when we've had you know, Laurel around and, you know, the, the, the different team members generally speaking i enjoyed a lot of them together uh felicity was one of the biggest weak points and, and diggle frankly were the bigger weak points but you know renee and dinah and we were, were pretty likable and i kind of feel the same here with mia and william in that yeah i like these two well enough uh on, on as part of a team in the present day doing actual stuff yeah i even got a chuckle when he uh Williams, you know, pretend to be this rich guy, like try to get his fighters in the ring when they've still got their, their green to be hoods fair, on. He is a rich guy. I, I do love though that they had like these boxing sort of robes, but they were both green. Their hoods. It was a nice of little touch. They were, yeah. uh, but like he's he's sort of like bargaining with the, the the woman running the whole thing, and she's like, "Nah, nah, nah, our fights are all booked." And unless you got something really new, he's like, "Well, have any of your teams fought six? And he, like he just makes it up on the fly. And as soon as like the woman turns around, me is like. Six? What are you doing here? What are you doing this? <laughs> it's just like, you'll be fine. Just, just you know, try not to die, it's fine. Um, so, like, you know, I mean, the episode was not bad. Like, it's it's not, not the greatest in the world, but I think it it, it did some decent little beats with the, with the father-daughter stuff. Um, I think they have chemistry. It's almost a shame that we can't have Amel around for a bit longer to, like, kind of be there as the, uh, the, the you know, like the, the, the Batman beyond Bruce Wayne, essentially uh to yeah. to the youngers but um and then i think even laurel's plot was okay like i mean it's, it really just amounts to a couple of scenes with uh, anatoly like him not trusting her but then trusting her by the end um but i did actually like the moment at the end where she meets lila because she met lila at the start to get the, what the mission was because lila is also working with the monitor as we've seen and lila believes the monitor is a good guy and that's why she's like kind of working behind everyone's backs and i, I actually did kind of like the moment where laurel kind of turns it down and says no i'm not betraying them and lila says well you know, eventually I'll tell them when the time is right, but, you know, it's not right, you know, now's not the time. And Laurel says, well, this is going to be awkward then. She just takes a step to the side and Oliver and Diggle walk. I thought that was a good moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, however, uh, that, that, that would have been a fine ending of the episode. Honestly, the, the tension ramps up there would have been fine, but then they also get they all get hit with sleeping darts. I, mean, I actually thought it was going to show us who shot the darts, but it doesn't. Because I don't see the monitor shooting them with sleeping darts. That feels a bit weird. He just teleport them somewhere. Yeah, so I think this is either Argus people under Lila's command or maybe someone else from the past. Yeah, because Lila wasn't shot, was she? No, it wasn't Lila. So I think it's either someone with her or someone else who's working for the Monitor who will recognise because it'll be someone from a past season. Yeah, I'm sort of interested to actually see who. Well, we've already had Prometheus and Tommy. We've already had Roy and Thea. We've had Anatoly. We've had, we've had a lot of the big staples. Uh, do you know who I know? I'm looking forward to who's coming back. Uh uh, we, we we get all son of a bitch himself, Lance. Yeah, he's in an episode coming up. They've been they've, they've been uh, posting all the promo pictures. Oh, okay, with him. well, multiple Earth, so yeah, I guess we'll get them from whatever. Yeah, but I'm down for it. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. It was, uh, okay, it was an okay episode. Honestly, you know, you know what I'll say about this episode is this is the first episode where I feel like. It has risen above just being 
hey, remember Russia? You know, you know, like because that's what this could have been. Sure. You know, like like the Hong Kong one was. Hey, remember Hong Kong season? Yeah. On, honestly, I was worried to get into it because you know I'm not a big fan of the Russian stuff, and I was worried that it was going to be bogged down in that. But honestly, it focused on telling a story between uh, Oliver and Mia, and yeah. a little bit with the others, but mainly Oliver and Mia. And because it focused on the character story first, I never felt bogged down in it. So, the only thing that really made it Russian, so to speak, was was Anatoly, right? And Anatoly has consistently been the best part of any of the Russia stuff. Oh, another moment so, that made me laugh was uh, William just saying something in Russian at one point, and then like Oliver just turning and like, "What the hell?" <laughs> and I was like, "I like this guy." <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, Anatoly stuff was fine. Like honestly, like. This week it was clearly, again, uh, it's been a few times this has happened, but Batwoman and Arrow are clearly the better two shows. Not perfect by any means, yep. they have the problems, they have stuff that we can complain about. Um, and I think this episode of Arrow is probably one of the better episodes of the five. Yeah, you know, last week was mm -hmm. a not great episode, but it had the, the one great moment with William. Yeah, the, 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 um, the worst one was definitely the Theo one, I think. Oh, definitely. But, you know, the Hong Kong one wasn't great either. I think it's it's kind of the first one, which was, oh, this is what we're doing this season. This could be fun. Yeah, yeah. And and then this one. And then, but that one scene with William is probably better than anything in either of those episodes. Yeah. No, that was a genuinely good scene last week, but or last episode. But, yeah. Um, so if we're picking our favorite of the week, um, it is between those two, I think. I think it's Batwoman and uh, uh, Without even a question of a doubt, it's, it's definitely between those. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a test because we, you know we 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 have so often on this show shat on Arrow uh, for the duration of like back when we reviewed the episodes individually, which are in the playlist on YouTube if you want to go check those out. Obviously, the audio podcast only starts from when we started the the, the podcast there as a whole. Are some famous rants of yeah. from Pete. Here. Yeah, yeah. If, if you if you um have only listened to the podcast in the audio version is a full thing. Before we started the podcast, we reviewed the shows individually, and there was two full years of that before the podcast. If you go to YouTube, there is in the playlist, the TV Multiverse playlist, there is actually all those old individual reviews in the the, the back catalogue still there. Just if, if you want an idea of some iconic rants that Pete oh, had. Oh, when Felicity gets when, out of the wheelchair. That one? Or when they teased the, the Oracle name for her? Which was the same scene. It was like this, the episode after that. <laughs> Or yeah, two yeah they, that were, even. they were different episodes though, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, uh, yeah, but they were um, really close together. It was like middle were, of season four. But, oh, they, they they were some spectacular rants. Yeah, there was there was yeah some solid stuff there. So, uh, so yeah, we have shot on Arrow for years at this point. So, and so I, I remember saying probably at the end of last season that I don't know if there's anything they can do to make me give a shit in this final season because what can they do? And for the record, I mean, this is the only season without Felicity, so it's notable that that's not there dragging it down. <laughs> Secondly, yep. um, and what I was going to say there is that this is a testament to actually, because you know an ending's coming, and you don't have to know an end. Good shows can do this without an ending and just have story that feels like it matters. But because we know an ending's coming, because the writers know an ending's coming, they're not spreading their wheels, they're telling focused stories because they're wanting to, you know, Oliver to have a good send-off with all these different characters. So each one has its own weight to it. And because of that, it's standing out versus the rest of the show. And given how much we have shat on this show for a long time, barring the odd, like, glimmer of hope here or there, you know, there was, one, episode. There was one good episode in season five, there was one good episode uh, last season, that stood out amongst the rest, but for the most part, it's really mediocre because it's doing all these crappy subplots. It's doing these crappy things with characters that aren't very interesting. We had the the, the reign of terror that was Diaz for like almost two seasons. Oh god! Like absolute and, terrible. And, and, and that was coming off the hero that was Prometheus. <laughs> he was laughably fun, but I mean, not good. Yeah, no, he he was not a good character, but yeah, the way I was just talking about this episode of Flash, I yeah. Mean, ideal for my drunk watching is that it was just stupid enough for me to get so much enjoyment out of it with the alcohol that's what prometheus was for arrow but yeah arrow is because i i don't know like i don't know if i would like season one and two that much i i was never as big on them as other people were anyway uh i was very critical uh of laurel stuff especially in season two yeah um so i don't know how much i'd even like them if i went back and watched them now uh, but I think that's probably what end up being my favourite season of Arrow, but just because A, it's doing some fun DC stuff because everything's about the monitor and crisis and all that cool sh shit. But honestly, the setup for the new stuff in uh, Oliver's Kids and the idea of this being his legacy, maybe it is because they're new and because they're not b bogged down with all the crap that Felicity and Diggle have had over the years where, you know, I look at Diggle and all I can think is, I shot my brother! I had to shoot my brother! I'm not thinking of Felicity and her nuking a town or getting out of the wheelchair. And 
and let's be honest, fundamentally, they are filling the same two roles. Mia is the backup muscle, and William is the guy <laughs> yeah. in the chair. Yeah. Although, from a legacy perspective, uh, I mean, he has the Felicity, but she'll be the arrow, she'll be the green arrow. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but right show. now she's playing the diggle, right? Um, it, and you know, to, to his to his arrow. And they're setting up that she may bond a little bit with Laurel, probably a, more so her and Dana in the backdoor pilot episode later in the season. They'll do, you know, that because that, that, that'll be the real thing that makes that a backdoor pilot is it'll be those three working as a team, maybe with William on comms, really setting things up. Uh, curious to see if Connor sticks around, but I'm definitely expecting William to be there as a main character. I'd be surprised if he wasn't. Yeah, and I'm kind of okay with that at this point. Like, don't get me wrong, the show might be terrible and just devolve no, into fine. the no, same CW yeah. stuff, but... Yeah, honestly, he's fine. Like, there's no reason why a, a Green Arrow show, uh, even with Amel, even even with the core ideas that this show has, can, can't be good, but the terrible rating for years just tore it to shreds. And this season, while not like a great season of television on its own, is proof that it can improve significantly with just a few key factors changing. Yeah, and I think I said, but I think having only ten episodes hugely helped because it does. They're like, yeah, okay, we we can do one episode this, one episode that, one episode that, and and they're not going. Well, this needs to last for three episodes, and then you know, and and then we can move on to the next thing. They're like, no, just bang, 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 knock. And, and some of it does because, like we say, that the Roy and Diggle stuff does feel like it's a little one note because it's just waiting for a truck and having the same conversation three times until Diggle finally tells him what he knows about the future. So it's, it's very just one note and does what it's doing. Um, and Roy didn't do any flips. And Roy didn't do any flips. Uh, so that stuff was definitely weaker, but. Like I say, I think the relationship, the chemistry between Amel and the kids, you know, Oliver and the kids, is mostly working for me. And they have they have that chemistry, and there's a little bit of weight to it, because we do know that he is leaving, and for the most part, and the show is ending, and we also know that there's going to be a spin-off with her as the lead character. So No, I agree, but honestly, I think these factors might land, even if those weren't the case. You know, like, you know, if, if the show wasn't ending, sure. or, you know, we didn't know that, and, you know, and yeah, there wasn't a spin-off, and we didn't know for certain whether he was going to be gone. You know, let's just say that they never announced this spin-off. They just said it was going to be Arrow season nine, but they actually, you know, pulled the rug out from under us, and she was the new Arrow, right? And they just carried on like that in theory. You know, let's hypothetically, a lot, you know, and we, and we were still going, oh well, is he actually going to be gone, or are they just going to be doing what? Uh, I think a lot of this would still land in terms of. I think that the the, Probably. the the acting is good enough to carry off between the three of them. I do think that um, it changing its name and being a new show is going to be for the better of it. Just because most times when a TV show tries to transition from one main character to another, it usually spells the end of the show. Uh, if not yeah. immediately, within a couple of seasons. It usually is seen as like a, a weak point in the whole thing. So I think it's a smart thing to kind of sh shape it as a different show. No, I think forward. I think that's why they're doing it, is because they yeah. are aware of those optics. Um but as I, said, I think fundamentally it could have just carried on as Arrow season nine, and we would probably gone, yeah, sure. Um, but maybe but having there, a there but, obvious reason. For it, yeah, yeah, but maybe having a clean slate is, is even good for us because we don't have that baggage in the same way. I mean, it's still there in the history, but like, you know, we can kind of okay, fresh eyes, new show. Let's see what they yeah. do with this. Um, yeah. So gives them an excuse to you know change the aspect ratio. Do, do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Maybe make the uh, the hood a bit more green, less dark. Yeah, that yeah. could be something they could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, hey, well, hey, Batwoman was allowed to change it. So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that's the other thing. Actually, <laughs> uh, uh, it was explaining the trick arrows at the start as well. There was a whole yeah. little montage. I was surprised though they didn't come back in this episode. Actually, yeah, I feel like it was setting them up for later. Yeah. They're, they're, they're going to pay off at some point in the season, I'm sure, with her using them. Oh, they must do, yeah. But so. uh, I, I did think it was going to be this episode. I, I think I appreciate that it wasn't this episode in that sense. Yeah, because it was such an obvious thing. Kind of, kind of like uh, Barry's strewn up in the flash. It was such an obvious thing you expected it to happen. So it was it was so, kind of pleasant that it didn't. It, same same yeah. with Laurel not betraying Oliver, thinking that it was for the right reasons. Like It was actually kind of more interesting for her to say, no, no I'm not going to do it. I'm going to tell them what's going on. Yeah, that was the more interesting choice from her character perspective. Oh, definitely. So, yeah. So, uh, are we saying Arrow was the best thing this week again? I think we are. I think Arrow. I think Arrow nudges it out. Although Batwoman uh, did have some good stuff and did, you know, have that provocative scene that made me think about. And not so much the, um, you know, like the the whole idea of the the 
the mistreatment of uh you know gay people in public is something that i necessarily needed a lesson on but it did make me think about it in a way that i hadn't thought about it before so for yeah. that uh, that's good i think um just you know to compare the two shows as well which one's better i think Bowen probably had the stronger moment overall like with that scene and mm-hmm. that is the best scene of the week um i think arrow is a bit better overall cons- more consistent overall i think you know about one had like three good moments th- spread throughout the episode whereas yeah. arrow i think i think you take out the, the 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 roy and diggle thing and i enjoy pretty much everything else there yeah that's fair so there you go that is a uh, television from the multiverse episode 82 uh, a bit of a longer one um, I have to timestamp that that sort of tangent that came out of Supergirl, which was relevant to the show, of course, because it was all DCTV related. Unlike the 20 minute talk about Google Stadia, which I am going to cut out and put on Patreon as a bonus bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, let us know what you think of uh, the, the the episodes this week in the comments below on, on YouTube, at least. Uh, like, subscribe, ring the bell. Uh, if you want the notifications always check out comics from the multiverse the dc comics podcast that we do with matt which is kind of like this one but we talk about the comic books every week and does tend to be a bit more positive although not always depends on the week um yep. comics go up and down a lot of course uh, lots of different writers uh, uh, uh you know uh, in, in the in the playing field um but of course you can support us by rating the podcast on apple podcast you can also Go over to uh, uh, patreon.com slash mailfuzztv where you can support us for as little as $1 per month and get some bonuses, the the, the, the bonus outtakes that obviously I've mentioned earlier, uh, bonus episodes of some of the other movie podcasts that we do, and then stuff at the higher tiers. In fact, one of the higher tiers uh, gets you a producer credit. That's at the $20 tier and up. So let me take this moment. Uh, I would really want to do this in the middle of the show, but I kind of forgot, so I'm doing it now. Uh, so uh, thank you to David Short, Alison M. Fordis, Cindy Palacios, Tyler Hess, and Talking Superman for being this month's Patreon producer. Uh, so thank you to all of you uh, so you can go over to Patreon and have a look see every dollar matters though so uh, don't feel bad for just being at the one dollar tier no one's expecting uh, you to spend a fortune uh, so just go and feel warm and fuzzy on the inside uh, but uh, you'll get us on Twitter at DC Comics Podcast uh, if you want to get us on there uh, but that is us so thank you once again for watching or listening in fact I've not been doing this as much recently so I'm going to do it here um, if you want to send us a question you can do it on Twitter Um uh, make sure it's clear for the TV shows, though, as opposed to the comic book stuff. And you can also send us a question or, uh, via email if you want to send a longer question, mftvquestions at gmail.com. And, and I'm reminded by this because I got an email this week for the other, you know, comics podcast uh, for DC, you know, comics. Oh, yeah, we, we, we need tons of questions on that right now. It's been very busy books wise, but uh, we'll have one question this coming week, I think, because uh, I got one. This is, this is a nice little and question. If, if anyone wants to ask us a question for, uh, related to this for next week, That'd be great timing, because there's only uh, two shows next week. That's true, yeah. It's a later week next week. So if you do want to send us questions uh, for this show, you can do it on Twitter, at DC Comics Podcast, or via email, mftvquestions at gmail.com. Uh, just put in the subject, Television from the Multiverse, and uh, ask your question. Uh, and we'll answer a couple uh, next week if we get any. So, uh, but that's So thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching silly superhero TV shows. But remember that sometimes we screw things up for the better. <laughs>